All right, I believe that we're live and we're feeding out to the folks out there. <laughs> Let me know how we're coming in, if there's any issues with my audio, if, um, if there's any issues with Reed's audio, let me know here and we'll get that worked out. We'll see, I don't, I don't hear anyone complaining. So usually I tell everyone that we are live on Utreon. Obviously if you're on Utreon watching us live now, you know it, but the reason why we're live on Utreon is so I can hold guns. <laughs> like that check it out this is uh this is actually my what would stoner do a build that i did with what would with uh brownells and uh liberty suppressors because that's integrally suppressed uh upper right here so a uh, very cool build here and we can do this we can do this youtube won't let us do this kind of stuff hold guns and all that so if you're listening on audio and you want to join us live or you're watching this we do put it up on youtube afterwards we upload it to youtube if you want to watch us live go to utreon slash who moved my freedom or freedom or wmmf that's the place and the way to find us there okay that being said i am going to kick it off if there's no complaints about anything uh, Armin and Axis says, cool, Reed is here. Yes, Reed is back. Let's kick this off and get it going here. I'm going to do the open, Reed. Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. We wouldn't be able to keep the Who Moved My Freedom podcast going without the support of great companies like Franklin Armory. Franklin Armory provides 100% U.S. made firearms and awesome binary option triggers. Their focus and purpose is to provide freedom tools to all Americans, especially those in not so free states. So when you're in the market, please consider Franklin Armory. All right. Okay. So, Reed, I've gotten a little fancy here in case you, we haven't done this in two years. So, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's gotten a little fancier. We've got like 20 minute segments. I don't know if you could see there's like a countdown there. In the, I don't know whether or not you could see it, but we, we've like we're breaking up into 20 minute segments. I'll let you know if you hear this. That means that means we have literally a minute and then we're going to take a break. So that's how that goes. And here's one of the things we're still doing here. Jazz hands. You got to do it. Don't care how macho you are. You got to get the jazz hands going. Take it back from the terrorists. There you go. <laughs> I hope you guys have your big girl panties on. We are live. This is the Who Moved My Freedom podcast. This is episode 930. 930 with my friend of a long time. Reed Henricks of Valor Ridge. He's a Marine. He's an author. He's a philosopher. He's a lot of things. Reed, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on again. I always enjoy being on with you. Uh, we've been friends for, we figured, we figured out over 10 years now, so yeah. it's always good to get back with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I haven't seen you in a long time. I, you know, uh, I'm not too macho to say, you know, I miss you, man. It's, uh, I miss hanging out with you, you know? How's it yeah, going? Yeah. Everything's going well. Uh, mm -hmm. Couldn't be better. You know, we've, we're teaching. We're doing good stuff. So, yeah, that's, I'm in good health. I wake up every day pain-free, thank the Lord. So I mm -hmm. uh, can't ask for much more than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, man, we've, we've done 930 episodes. Like in 70 episodes, we hit 1,000. 1,000. So That's, that's crazy. It's, it, it, it goes by quick. Yeah, and you're in, in a, quite a few of them, but it has been two years. Um, did we, I think the last show we got together was like in the beginning of this whole COVID thing, maybe? Probably, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you yeah. know, it, it seems like it. It's been a bit, it's been a yeah. long time. Yeah, man. So for folks out there who don't know, and there's, you know, a lot of people know, I see Night Train saying Reed Hendricks rocks. Rocks, excuse me. Uh, uh, there's a lot of folks who know you, but for the folks who don't know you, let's you know kick this off a little bit. Give uh, you know give people a little bit of a resume. You know who are you? What do you do? How did you come to be doing this? Uh, that's a good question. I actually am, uh, <laughs> just started reflecting on that this morning. Actually, it's kind of weird to you know think about it. But my resume is I was in the Marine Corps. I spent four years active duty. I was an O three fifty one assaultman. So. Um, ended up becoming a section leader and I got promoted to sergeant. Um, so I was a DM designated marksman instructor on there. I trained people on the M14 and uh, was a Marine Corps martial arts program instructor as well in the combatives. 
Um, when I got out, I did law enforcement. So I did some pretty cool stuff in law enforcement for the short amount of time I was in it. I was able to do patrol, um, but I was also able to do undercover narcotics. And I also did Task Force Illinois. We went down to uh, New Orleans for Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And when I got out of law enforcement is when I really started to learn how to shoot because then I started training a lot of different places. And, you know, when you first start training, it wasn't like I first started training, but when I first started doing commercial firearms training and, you know, a lot of guys want to train a lot of different places. So you train a lot of different places and then mm-hmm. you, know, you kind of try to figure it out from there. Um, and so I came to, to do this. I was actually teaching high school and, you know, one, one day is just one of these things where I enjoy the kids and everything. I enjoy teaching them because I did history. But um, one day I got an opportunity to, to teach firearms full time. So I did that. And then I've been teaching firearms full time now for 10 years and I've been running my own business now for eight years. And so it, it goes by very fast so for you younger guys watching out there. You know, like Ferris Bueller said back in the 80s, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to, to, t- to take a look around every while and then you'll miss it. Yeah. So it does go fast. <laughs> Yeah, you you get old doing this. Um, what what age range are you in, man? I turned fifty this year. Not quite there, Hank, but uh, we're, we were we were in the same uh, we were in the same bracket there for a while. Same 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 ballpark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How was it teaching uh, high school? Do you do you miss that kind of stuff? Yeah, there's parts of it I miss. I miss the kids. You know, I miss um, I miss the students a lot. I miss uh, being able to impart real history, real knowledge on people in civics, American, you know, patriotism. I did that a lot. Um, I, it was nice. I, I never had a single discipline problem. You know, and I taught public school for for three full years, and you know, I never had a single discipline problem. Um, it was basically a, a give respect, get respect, but respect is earned. You know, and. I was never uh, a person that was a screamer. I was never a person that did hardcore discipline, but we set expectations in the classroom. And um, in fact, I just went to a couple of high school students of mine uh, wedding in June. Uh, Hunter and Jesse, they've been married. And I was I was their teacher the first day they started dating. So they, they oh, dated wow. all the time and ended up getting married. <laughs> kind of a cool story. Wow, yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah. You're in you're in the story of their life for sure. <laughs> Learn the story of my life for sure yeah. because they give me hope for the younger people, uh, knowing mm-hmm. people like that and knowing that that generation is a lot of good people in that age group and um, it, it was all amazing experience and, and I'm uh, I just reflect on that and just how I got to this point in life is just having great experiences with good people for the vast majority of my life. Yeah, if you guys want to know more about Reed, if you don't, uh, I would. I mean, really, all you have to do is Google him, you know, Reed Henricks, put that in. Um, check out Battle Ridge, the website, if you want to know more stuff here. I would, you know, definitely advise everyone to do that if you're looking for training, etc. I know you've got uh, some books out there as well. Let me see. Where is the... Okay, here we go. There's Your books are on Amazon, American Rifleman, and I know you have a pistol book out as well. Did you do a history book? Uh I, I I thought about it. I, I oh, mean, okay. I'm working on I'm working on the third one right now, and okay. I'll try to I'll try to finish that up before uh, before the holidays. So mm-hmm. I am working on that. One. It's more of a compendium book, and then the history one that that may be a couple years out because that's that's going to take some research and footnoting. I mean, that's going to be practically a uh, dissertation. So mm-hmm. you know, that stuff takes a lot of time. Yeah. Would you say that you are a teacher at heart? Well, you know, like if someone asked you, you know. I think we all do a bunch of different things, but if someone asked you, you know, what 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 kind of job do you think is at your core? What would you say? I would. Um, I mean, people always like self-proclaim as an instructor, a trainer, or teacher. I mean, I hear it all the time, but I, I look at this as a steward. Mm-hmm. You know, we we get this knowledge for a short amount of time. You know, mm-hmm. we get it from those that pass it on to us. And, you know, I always tell people all the time, like, uh, you know, the only reason why I'm able to do what I do is because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, the people that came before me, the, the men that I learned from. And I look at it as a steward because we get to take the torch for a little while, um, get to help as many people as we can. And then eventually we have to we have to pass that torch on. So I would look at it as a stewardship. It's it's ours for a little bit. And then we have to we have to give it back. OK, yeah. I just like when I think about you. Obviously, you're a trainer. You're a lot of things, right? But when I when I think about you, I think you are a teacher. You really enjoy passing on 
uh, the knowledge that you have. And the, and the good kind of teacher, like you're talking about high school, anyone that remembers back to high school, you must have had at least one of those cool teachers, you know, who's not just coming there to punch in and punch out, that really cares about what they're doing. And, and I think you're like that. Even when you're doing your class, it's not about like a macho uh, trip or anything like that. You really want to help people and teach them things and, and give them, give them, uh, what is it? It's like, you can either give a man a fish or teach him how to fish kind of thing. Right. Yeah. We're, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, we're about shooter development. We're, we're about helping people, uh, get better and develop themselves. So, I mean, we teach them, you know, the core things that they need fundamentals. It's not flashy. Like none of the stuff we do is flashy because real shooting and real tactics aren't flashy. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, uh, we're not here to entertain you, you know, we're here to, to help you get better and develop you. And it is hard work because you're going to get a lot of repetitions out there. And we're definitely about developing people, developing their, their, their uh, fundamentals, developing their tactical maturity, you know, things like that. And, and yeah, teaching is, is an important aspect of that. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I've always enjoyed, uh, seeing the light bulb go off in people's eyes. It's something I've enjoyed for a long time. And, you know, that's really what it's about. Uh, you know, we, we tell people a lot, you know, a lot of the students and, you know, I've said it before in my videos that I won't tell you what you want to hear. I'll tell you what you need to hear. And, um, we do attract a, a very intelligent student, uh, overall in any class you could have pilots or surgeons or, uh, people that drive big rigs, uh, guys that run businesses, guys that are retired. Mm-hmm. Um, so of all ages. So, I mean, yeah, they're, they're smart people too. So we use that inherent intelligence with them so that they can help develop themselves. So yeah, it is, it is about enabling people to, to help themselves and get better for sure. Absolutely. Uh, what, you know, I think when it comes to training in the gun world, a lot of people have trepidation about that going to do training. And I understand it. You don't, a lot of times if you've never been to that particular class or you've never done a class, you're nervous about it, etc. What would you say to people who have that feeling, and then how would you describe how you run the school? Well, first I'd tell them I've been there. Uh, you know, when I when I learned how to shoot guns, it wasn't in the most pleasant environment on the planet. You know, it was uh, people yelling at you and screaming at you, and um, you know, in, in the military side of the house, and then in law enforcement, it was kind of the same way. In law enforcement, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times in law enforcement, they'll take the guys that may not be the best street guys, and then they'll put them in the firearms instruction part. So it's like, <laughs> why, why job. is that? <laughs> they weren't good at the job and then they're really not good shooters. So it's like, you kind of, you kind of get it on both ends. So, I mean, right, but, right. but yeah, I understand what it's like to answer your first part is like, mm-hmm. you know, do I, you know, a lot of people do approach with trepidation. I mean, geez, just look at some of the characters out there. Um, you know, I'm not going to mention any specific names, but I mean, all you have to do is, is watch YouTube videos on some of the stuff that's out there. I mean, um, yeah, I, I could understand that if I was just a, a normal person or even if I was a, you know, a person who had, you know, served or did any of that stuff. I mean, I could see a lot of that stuff and women, especially, you know, uh, we've got a lot of women in class and, um, I understand how that stuff is, but you know, how we approach things here is, is adult learning. So, you know, e- there's specific things you have to do for adult learning. And so as a you know professional educator, you know, you learn that I figure if I can keep a class of high school students entertain for hour and a half at a time adults are pretty easy yeah well yeah it should be it should be what um so you know what would be be your advice to someone out there who's like okay i want to do this how do you think they should pick the the you know training center the the school the you know whatever it is that they go to how should they pick that how should they you know look around and figure that out yeah, I would. Um, I would look at the instructor's background. Like, does their experience is it relevant to yours? I mean, you could have guys out there that did really cool stuff in the military, but how applicable is that to you as a family man or a family woman? You know, how applicable is it? And the other thing I would look at is is more like comprehensive. Like, is it just about shooting, or is it about developing yourself like as a holistic aspect of your life? How you live your life? Are they going to help you with target discrimination? Are they going to help you? Uh, with the basic things that you need to do all the time. And I would look at, uh, you know, basically, you know, what I would, what I'd really, really look at is what do you want to accomplish as a person? Do you just want to learn how to shoot good? Because there's a lot of places out there that you can shoot a bunch of rounds and, and you can get entertained. And um, my philosophy on training is width, is uh, depth over width. So when I talk about that, it's like, 
there's a lot of schools out there that will teach you a lot of stuff over two, three, four, five days. They'll teach you a lot of stuff, a lot of different drills, a lot of round count, making a lot of brass. Um, you know, you'll do a lot of different drills. That's wide. And then depth is that you're going to hit the core fundamentals, the core modules. You're going to hit those again and again and again. And you're not going to we're not going to do a wide set of drills. But what we're going to do is the core consistent mechanically sound fundamental drills where you're going to get good repetitions on the gun because that's what saves lives. It's fundamentals that wins gunfights. And it's always been that way. It'll always be that way. And, you know, so we go deep uh, rather than wide in our training. And that's what I would look for if I was beginning as a shooter. I would I would look for depth over width and I would look on education over entertainment. And I would look at uh, in the big picture, I would really look on the emphasis on the basics and I would look at somebody who is there to help you develop as a shooter and who is there not for the money, not for eat, not for relevancy, uh, who's there because they want to be there rather than they have to be there. Okay. So um, there's some, there's some questions coming in here and I know you can't see any of this stuff, right? So I, I cannot. Yeah. You cannot see uh, the questions, but if you guys have questions, I will take them. I'll tell you right now, I'm probably not going to give Reed every question that you guys are asking. I know, Reed, you go live. Uh, sometimes you do your own stuff. You do it on YouTube, and we, we will definitely you know take time to let people know where they can go talk to you. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that people ask you all the time that you probably don't answer. So I, you know, I apologize to folks, but I'm going to screen. <laughs> I'm going to screen some of that stuff out just because I don't really feel like it, it's worth it to get into old stuff and all that. So I'm just not going to do it. Uh, Brian Quick says, "What's the typical round count in Reed's pistol class? Typical round 300 count. Three hundred rounds. Three hundred. Okay. Actually, you, you, well, you'll you'll shoot less than that. We tell people to bring three hundred, but you'll mm -hmm. shoot a lot less. Yeah. Um, and so, what and what classes do you have going on now? So, I man, the last time I was out there, what was it like four years? I know the last time I talked to you was two years ago. I've been there yeah, at least well, twice." Yeah, we do uh, we do pistol and rifle classes, and we've got a lot of different ones. Um, you know, we we've got a, uh, for pistol classes. You know, we do uh, austere conditions, which is a really lot of unusual drills that you normally wouldn't do, be able to do on a normal range. But we control and structure the training properly so that uh, there's not uh, danger or anything like that. But it is unique. Um, you know, we do active shooter. So that's uh, definitely, you know, based on room clearing and hallway clearing, target discrimination, moving innocent bystanders out of the way, uh, breaking angles inside structures. We uh, have some force on force in that class, which is very valuable training. And then we also do a home defense class, which is uh, clearing your house, uh, doing, learning how to do that by yourself. And we also do that, a lot of that stuff in low light for home defense. So a lot of people really like that class. And in terms of rifle, we obviously do our rifle in one. We do mid-range where we have people go out to pass 600 yards with the with the carbine, with iron sights or red dot or whatever they normally use on their rifle. Um, we also do neighborhood defense, which is uh, building cleanings, uh, clearings in teams. And we do some vehicle work in that class. And we do fire team tactics, which is team-based uh, small unit movement. And we also do a home defense rifle class as well. So we've got quite a bit of offerings out there. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, like I said, if you go to Valor Ridge, you will be able to, if you go to the website, you'll be able to get answers uh, to all of that stuff. Brian Quick was asking about the force on force. I think, um, I think you answered that. Do you, um, do you want to give a shout out to some of the other guys? I know you don't do this alone. You've got other guys working with you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I got a couple guys that have been there for for a very long time, and some people, you know, when they can make it. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, my buddy JJ, I, um, you know, he's he's a uh, He's an old school retired Illinois State Trooper. He's been out here since the very first class, and yeah, he's been coming back ever since. So JJ's been helping me out a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Clay, you know, he uh, he just had a, a kid, so now he's got two kids, and he's recovering from a uh, back injury that he sustained in the line of duty. He's a police officer in Southern Illinois, so he sustained a pretty bad injury, but he's recovering. He'll be he'll be back to, he'll be back uh, he'll be back off the shelf here, hopefully by the end of the year. Okay. Um, you know, so yeah, those guys have been here from the very beginning, and they've they've really helped me out a lot. Yeah, and it's a it's a nice place for anyone who hasn't gone up there. It's a nice uh, part of uh, Tennessee. What are you in the northeastern part of Tennessee? Yeah, I'm looking at yeah. three states right now. My 
porches. Oh. I'm on my porch. I'm looking out <laughs> that way right over there. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm looking out. I'm looking at Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky. Uh, mm-hmm. Sitting on my back porch, I can actually see all three of those states from right here. Yeah, Lola is putting a link up to Valor Ridge in the chat if anyone wants to go there. And uh, we got like two minutes. So uh, 2A 1973 says, what age should I start my son training? Uh, you know your kid better than anybody. So, I mean, th- there's no hard age number for people because some kids mature faster than others. Some are more responsible than others. I mean, you would know your kid better than anybody on the planet. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a situational thing. I, I can tell you that I've worked with, with kids, you know, not in class, but on a private level. I've worked with kids as, as young as eight. Um, the youngest kid that we've had in class has been like 12 or 13. Okay, 12 or 13. Okay, cool. But to you, so like if someone thought that, hey, my four-year-old is good, and, and you know, I've seen some stuff on social media. Social media yeah. doesn't really mean that they're that good. So what do you <laughs> do with that? If someone thinks a four-year-old is good enough, do you just take their word on it? Do you have some kind of competent, competence? Why am I uh, hanging up on that? Competency test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, like, you know, in the American heritage, I mean, people started teaching their kids young. And, and I mean, in times past, it wasn't uncommon for people that, uh, you know, were first graders. I mean, that could go out and, and put food on the table for their family unsupervised. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, just like anything else, though, it's modern times. So, I mean, you, you know your kid better than anybody. And I think that, that that'd be a, a wise individual decision for every family and when they should introduce their, their kids to firearms. Absolutely. Yeah. Competency. Competency, <laughs> competency. Yeah, my parents were teachers, so I get caught up on things like that. If I mess up like that with around my mom, you know, that means now I got to sit there and write it out, spell it, do all, you know, do all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff uh, to get used to it. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we're going to come right back, and we're going to continue with Reed. Walther Arms has been making concealed carry handguns for over 90 years, starting with the PPK. Today, Walther is based in the good old US of A and still builds quality firearms like the PPQ and PDP for personal defense and competition. So when you're in the market, please consider Walther Arms. We wouldn't be able to keep the Who Moved My Freedom podcast going without the support of great companies like Walther Arms. All right, so typically, um, you know, I don't really have a plan here. I do break it up into 20 minutes just so we can make it more manageable, you know, make the two hours more manageable. But we're in the news section. So any, what news or what things out there are on your mind? I mean, everyone knows you're, you're very capable of speaking your mind. What's on your mind these days, news-wise? Yeah, you know, well, I'm looking at a couple of things. I mean, the Bruin case was cool, so I'm, I'm really happy that Justice Thomas wrote that decision. I think it was a good decision. I uh, can't really criticize a whole lot on it. The only thing I would do is, um, you know, get rid of any fees associated with any kind of, of, of mm-hmm. whatever states want to have you do. I, I mean, that. Okay. I mean that's basically a poll tax, right? I mean, paying for a concealed carry permit's a poll tax. People... People have, uh, you know, in the Supreme Court upheld that you you don't have to pay to vote. So why should you have to pay to carry a firearm? So, yeah, you know, fortunately, you know, we live in Tennessee and I know a lot of other people in 24 other states live in a permitless carry state. And I know even more than that have open carry uh, without anything as well. So, I mean, you're really looking at like 37, 38 states in the country where you don't have to pay anything at all. So that's a good start. It needs to be 50 out of 50. And uh, the Bruin case was good. Happy about that, and I think it's a you know we just keep keep chipping away at this stuff. Uh, yeah. I've got a lot of, of of good feelings about that case, and I think a lot of these states are going to come kicking and screaming into the Constitution, whether they like it or not. So the the thing about the Bruin case is enforcement of what they said, right? Because I mean we're seeing every day examples of either states or judges and and other entities pushing back on that or just ignoring it altogether. And I think, listen, I'm happy about it, and it's definitely something to celebrate, but does it really, because the Supreme Court made that decision, does it mean that instantly, you know, we get that? Obviously, we have it from the Constitution, but, you know, we're playing these silly games. So what do you think about all the pushback against that, and how do we enforce it? It's, it's going to be, uh, it's one of those things. I mean, I know there's, we have students from all 50 states. So, I mean, we've got people from, all, I mean, states like New York and California and Massachusetts, Jersey, you know, all those places where it's just, mm-hmm. you know, really difficult uh, for firearms ownership in those places. But uh, how do you know, 
my thing is this is that um you know generally <laughs> especially in the last 30 40 years the second amendment's expanded quite a bit uh, i mean we all know what it is i mean we can talk about oh it's it's our mm-hmm. it's our constitutional right it's our god-given right and that's absolutely true mm-hmm. unfortunately like government officials you know they don't see it that way but just because they don't see it that way that that doesn't mean that they get to get their way uh, i mean think about all the laws in this country over the last 200 plus years you know that have been done away with and that's like some of them were done away with overnight some of them it took time some of them it ta- it took years and years to do it but you know the thing good thing is like you know this brewing case even out in california with um with their assault weapon stuff with uh the ninth circuit you know that's getting kicked down to justice or to uh, judge benitez and we know how he rules on stuff so you know it's uh i i it is frustrating like having to see people in other states that don't have their second amendment respected by their idiot people in charge but um my thing is is always talking about patience and 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 not just knee jerking reaction to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, history is on your side. You know, history is on on the Second Amendment side. History is on. Uh, it, it just keeps moving better and better and better. I mean, all the last three Second Amendment cases have been in our favor. So, uh, as you talk about enforcement of that, um, man, you know, that that's <laughs> the wheels of justice turn slow. And if, I didn't design the system, and I don't even like it, but it is yeah. truly what we have in place so uh, so um, what i'm what i'm trying to get to there and i know it's kind of like a weird touchy thing right so i don't know whether or not you want to answer this but people ask me this question uh, one day a friend of mine that's a marine asked me that question he's like dude what's the point that we stop looking at all of this and do something about it like how do you know what is the point when you know we know like hey now we're going to have to do something and it's a touchy thing right because yeah. Like, we're all individuals. <laughs> How do we collectively come to that point? Do we not collectively come to that point? Do people individually, like, what what happens here? I mean, if you look at history in this country, there, there's, it, it's always started with, with small groups of people. But, you know, that was uh, like the American Revolution. I mean, people, people look at that and they think, oh, it was a... The spirit of 76 and all these patriots stood up against the British. No, it was a very, very small group of people. Like George Washington's army at any given time, I think at its height, had like 25,000 people in it at a in a nation of 3.5 million. So do the math on that one. Uh, mm-hmm. People want to talk about 3% and 1%. It's less than that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and as far as, as like when do we do something, um, I, that's an individual decision. I, I look at like, what what you know i read books like uh, you know william shire's uh, rise and fall of the third reich and how the germans consolidated gained and consolidated and then finalized their power in a very short amount of time and how they did it uh, especially with the press especially with the uh, gestapo and i look at, at at books like the gulag archipelago by alexander solzhenitsyn and how the you know the what would later become the kgb uh how they implemented this stuff and it's always uh, this this like piecemeal approach and you know in the United States of America you know at least in in many places there's there's certain checks and balances on it but then mm. <laughs> the former president of the United States isn't immune from their stupid games I don't know who else would be either so you know um, yeah. I, I look at it as an individual thing I mean I can tell you this uh, you know moving forward the FBI is not a legit law enforcement agency it's the enforcement part it's the enforcement arm of the Democrat Party Mayor Garland the head of the Department of Justice has said that uh, you know his aim is to uphold the agenda of the Biden administration well uh, okay uh, my objective is to not uphold the agenda of the Biden administration my, my, my objective is to demolish it um, get rid of all their stupid policies so we're at odds and you know the thing is is like uh, everybody's got to make a decision on themselves. I mean, if, uh, here it is. We're on a podcast talking about these issues. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got firearms. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of armed people in this country. Uh, is it bad? A lot they're- of people. Not just, they're not all like me, or and they're definitely not all like you. <laughs> so That's okay. It's the you whole know, rainbow represented, right, amongst gun owners. It's not just, it's not just conservatives. It's conservatives, liberals, uh black white people (laughs) you know people who just came to america people who families have been here for a long time it's a lot of different people good guys and bad guys 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And it's it's all right. I mean, I look at it this way. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you look at history, I mean, when, when, when it's too late to do anything is when you're disarmed. You know, when it's too late to do anything is um, – is is when people just start disappearing i mean that's generally when it's too late i mean we're not there you know we're not disarmed we're not uh uh you know there and i'm not saying that threat doesn't exist but i look at it objectively and realistically rather than from an emotional standpoint mm-hmm. if we truly were in a totalitarian society we wouldn't sitting here talking about this openly and in public and we certainly wouldn't be going and uh, buying firearms at gun stores where the government has to check your background, although I think that's horrible in itself. But mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a hard question, man. It's like you just wig out and like, uh, like where do you, where would you even begin with something like? You know, I mean, is there like a like is there like a hierarchy of where to start and stop? I don't know. I mean, it's um, it's yeah. a very difficult question. It's not otherwise because it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go like 1775 and 1776, or it's going to go like the French Revolution and. You know, the, the French Revolution didn't go so well. Yeah, I think, it, you know, my answer to, to my own question um, would be that it's it's in your soul, you know. It, it's within you. Whatever it is you believe in, there's a part of you that uh, is connecting to something just more than your mind, right? It's like some kind of collective feeling that you come to and you realize, wow. And a lot of times you're going to have to face things on your own. How many times in history, like you were saying, folks had to face things on on their own? No one was there, and 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 they probably didn't even win. How many people lose before twenty five thousand people get together and and start fighting to win? Yeah, I, I mean, right now it's a weird time in our country because it's just um, the general mood. Uh, whether, whether I don't care where you are on the political spectrum, but the general mood to me is not one of happiness. I think. I think the general mood is one of um, exasperation. Uh, mm-hmm. The general mood is that of anger. Um, the general mood is is that of uncertainty. And it's during those kind of conditions, I think people tend to lose hope. But I, I always warn people against, against a defeatist attitude because I, I like people with can-do attitudes, people that uh, actually push the ball forward. My good friend V, he's up in New York. Um, he's a... Uh, an amazing guy. He just, um, he's got a wonderful family and he's made Breitbart news. He's made USA today. He's Who pushing. Is Who is this? Uh, ZV, ZV Waldman. T Z V I. Okay. He spelled Z V I mm-hmm. last name Waldman W A L D M A N. He made okay. Breitbart news like in the last couple weeks. He's doing, he's doing all kinds of, of litigation up there in New York. You talk about the enforcement about the Bruin case. He's, on the ground level pushing that stuff forward he's got multiple lawsuits in the works that's a tough fight yeah and the lawyers play a big part in this i know a lot of times we knock lawyers in america i mean you know it it is what it is but also very important part of america right uh let me ask you this while we're on this i don't want to get too far away from this you mentioned the whole fbi trump raid uh give me your thoughts on this man where you at (laughs) <laughs> I'm at the prime, probably the same point that like the vast majority of people in this country are is it's an absolute farce. Uh, Merrick Garland should should be impeached immediately. He should he should have never been appointed Attorney General of the United States. He's a political hack. He's a DC lifer, uh, absolute scumbag, dirtbag, uh, little pencil pusher, vindictive little prick. And uh, you know the other people out there is like uh, and and the and thing with the FBI's. You know, here's the thing, man, like stuff like that just doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I guess there's good news on this because I just saw today that there's like all kind of FBI whistleblowers coming out and going to Congress about this raid on Mar-a-Lago. So Mm -hmm. um, can't really operate in the dark like they used to. I mean, stuff's going to come out. And then, of course, then people say, well, nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. And I'm right there with you on the frustration. But at the very least, I mean, geez, man, how many times have have we seen this stuff with with Trump, like people trying to take him down and they find absolutely nothing? I find it, I mean, here's the thing, like what Democrats and libtards do is is that they'll always try for a political, like, assassination of somebody, a political, like, burial, if you will. I mean, I find it no coincidence that they did this three months out from from November. Especially when they want, when, uh, remember, we're talking about a country at a point before they started doing this. The point before Nancy Pelosi uh, went out to Taiwan, right? At that point, people were really, really pissed off. 
this is a good moment to start wagging the dog, you know, to, to find distractions and point people in different directions, especially your base. So if you if you think about it, when Trump ran, he ran on lock her up now and people and people on our side responded to that. But when he became president, he didn't he didn't go forward with that. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, on the was, other side, was... they don't feel that way. No, it's it's a uh, the thing is though it's not really going to change anybody's mind one way or the other. I mean, the, the the people that that would that's the people like that love Biden and love like what's happened the last year and a half, which I don't know how you could unless you're a brain dead imbecile. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I love having like ten percent less of my spending power. Yay, I love like <laughs> paying freaking a hundred dollars to fill up my my vehicle. Yeah, Nobody if you like that, that it's not going to change your mind. You know, um, yeah. You know, it's not going to change your mind. Like they, he would; those people would think he's guilty of anything. So you've got that, like that demographic that, no matter what, they believe that Trump is guilty of something. And on the other side, like you got people that support him and voted for him, and they're like, like no matter what happens, like there's no way he's ever going to be guilty. So I don't; it's not going to make any bit of a difference. But what if I was if I was a part of this administration, like right now, and I had absolutely nothing to run on, zero accomplishments other than the pain and abject misery of the vast majority of people in this country, I would try to distract the whole country day after day with other stuff, like besides any policy that they fail or enact. Like, so that it's like, if I didn't have anything to run on, then I would like, you know, make up stuff or, or just like do like four press conferences, like in a year and a half. Yeah. So my, so here's one of the things about this, right? The big thing here that bothers me is the FBI as an institution. Um, You know, I wasn't born in America. I spent the early part of my life outside of America. But one of the American institutions that people on the outside look at is the FBI. These are supposed to be the the folks who have honor. (laughs) This is like who we're all supposed to trust at the end of the day. Regardless of who's president or how you're doing it, you know, even if it's not a guy that you vote for, you no one the people of America don't want to see this kind of stuff happening to to anyone, not regular citizens, much less someone who was president. And you know that it's a political, uh, you know, political thing that they're going after this guy. And it's not just Mar-a-Lago, right? I'm not a super Trump fan. I, I voted for him but I'm not a super Trump fan. It's not just Mar-a-Lago. It's lots of things in America. It's over and over and over again. The FBI is dropping the ball. You know, there's all these school shootings that they get prior warnings about, and they fail to investigate. They don't do anything about it. You know, it's so many things that's happened with the FBI that if I was an FBI agent, I would hang my head down in shame. I know not all of them are terrible, like you said. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lot of good guys in the FBI, but that's really the the really terrible part of this. The, the list of failures goes on and on. I mean, Ruby Ridge, Waco, 9/11. Um, I mean, constant failure. I mean, just 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 constant, constant ineptitude, constant failure. And if their ineptitude wasn't enough, now on top of the ineptitude, then you have the vindictiveness. Mm-hmm. on top of all that right now and and straight up just corruption uh you know especially when when it's all that with with all the things we've seen just with hunter biden just with hillary oh yeah i mean hunter, just absolute, the hunter uh, thing is ridiculous i mean this is a dangerous this is a dangerous guy who did bad super illegal things and nothing yeah and that's the thing man i mean it, it's it's time it, it you know i think that we as Americans, and I don't care which side of the political aisle that you're on, I think I think that we as Americans should probably look at the FBI as probably having served its purpose and run its course. I think um, I think a lot of people can agree that uh, that they have outlived their usefulness, and it was maybe in the beginning it was a reaction to violent bank robbers like John Dillinger, Machine Gun Kelly, Prohibition. You know, at the beginning, it was a reaction uh, to that. Oh, if we just have this federal agency, then there won't be any more bank robbers. And if we just have this agency, then there won't be any violent gangsters. And if we, uh, but see, when those times come and go, mm-hmm. and they're still in existence, kind of like the ATF. I mean, they, they had to find a job for those guys after prohibition. I mean, right. they were, they were, so, yeah. so it's like you know, but but they're like like you know, I'm, you know, like Ronald Reagan said, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. So. You know, it's um, 
it's, it's this weird thing. And, and I think that, but if, you know, talking about solutions, talking about things moving forward rather than just complain about it, that's one thing I would like the next Congress uh, to take a look at is, is defunding and disbanding the FBI. I, I, I think it's time. I think the, the opportunity or the, um, the, uh, the chance of, of them abusing their power and the, the, the mechanism that it is, I, I think that the likelihood of it being misused and it has been misused, I think it's too great. And I think that they have too many resources and too much power. And um, quite honestly, I would much rather see a more localized uh, mm-hmm. view of, <laughs> of dealing with people than the FBI. Yeah, I think there's a lot of institutions we need to look at and uh, revamp, if not get rid of altogether. I, I don't think there's a high likelihood that that's actually going to happen. The big problem we have here, it's not just Democrats, it's Republicans as well. You know, yeah. that's that's how we got here. Yeah, that's that's why that's why I mentioned Congress as a whole because uh man, those those guys just love their their alphabet agencies, don't they? And I just mm-hmm. um I look at I look at things like the ATF, the FBI, uh all of them. I mean, they're just they're very 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 bloated. Um they're uh misused um and once yeah. they start being used for political purposes that's when it's time to shut them down yeah. the post office <laughs> yeah the irs oh, no. for sure the irs oh, for sure. Now, oh now, it's, now it's like the irs hiring eighty-seven thousand more people and they they want them armed and willing to use deadly force you know the last time tax collectors showed up armed on american soil and tried to enforce that by force i don't think it didn't work too well yeah yeah absolutely yeah i, I want to talk about that we got like a, a minute here so I want to definitely talk about that here in the next section. Uh, 2A 1973 says, where do you think we're at timelines while, timeline-wise in a parallel with our forefathers? To me, I see January 6th as a Boston Tea Party. Yeah, a few years, yeah. Um, understand, you know, the, the, it's it's always, everybody wants the, the, like the, the comparison and all that. I think that we're certainly on that timeline. Maybe, let's say proclamation of 1763 maybe the stamp act somewhere in there you know mm-hmm. but close he's absolutely right the tea party was 73 so yeah i mean i, I could see it close Un- unless of course i mean it's not this given like inevitable like delivery yeah. to the end i mean the, you know the, how quick can things change yeah absolutely we're going to take a break we're going to come right back we wouldn't be able to keep the who moved my freedom podcast going without the support of great companies like high point firearms and full forge gear bags and gear for everyday life did you know high point is an american family owned and operated company located in ohio with over 30 years of manufacturing experience High Point is proud to be the home of the working man's gun and your source for affordable handguns and carbines with a lifetime warranty. So when you're in the market, please consider Hype. All right, so, um, yeah, time's going so fast, man. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we could just we could just talk and, uh, and go here for a long time. Let me get some uh, questions in from folks out there that we haven't hit on. What's like, okay, we're, kind of, we're in Gorn, so we'll, we'll show up. We'll show some. We'll show some guns. Look, I'll hold, I'll hold up something here in a second. Uh, Brian Quick says, has Reed read the book called The Fourth Turning by Strauss Howe? So there you go, Strauss Howe. If I did, it was a long time ago because I do remember that name. Um, okay. So I, I can't comment on it right now. Right. Remember it's- <laughs> you do a lot of reading. You do a lot yeah. of reading. Um, let's see what else we got here. 42 Chilled says lots of vets that are trained out there. Uh, that was in response to some stuff we said. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Um, Brian Quick says there isn't going to be another civil conflict. So many Americans have been tenderized by fourth and fifth generation warfare. What do you think about that? Um, t- I mean, maybe, maybe some have, um, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some have, but, uh, you know, tenderized is a is a good word, or maybe hypnotized. I think mm-hmm. um, it's just the mind. You know, understanding your mind and, and getting it right. But uh, keep in mind, though. I mean, never underestimate uh, people that are pissed off enough and that have not just the righteous indignation in their heart, but never uh, never underestimate. You know, people that are that are willing uh, that have accomplished all the things in the life that they ever hope to accomplish money uh good relationships 
mm-hmm. um, accolades. Don't don't underestimate people that that what they value the most is is mm-hmm. passing on a better country to those that come after them. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me see if there's any other. There's a lot of stuff here. I'm trying to go through um, and see what else is going on here. What other things? What other things in the news? <laughs> Obviously, the Trump thing is one of those things. I think that's going to probably go on for a while. Um, well, you know, it's it's hard. You know, I mean, the, the thing is, is that I, and I would caution a lot of people out there, especially when it comes to when you care about something so much. And I'm sure a lot of your viewers, as well as mine, we probably have a lot of the same ones, uh, care about this country. They care about our, our way of life. But I, would, I would caution people out there, you know, to... Uh, always be in this state of agitation and always being in a state of angst because that's that's where the least amount of creativity is uh, you know that's not a very creative state and when you look at all the stuff if you respond to every news story i mean look at all the stuff with, with, that's happened with trump for the last six years it started with you know the first impeachment second impeachment russian collusion special counsel now it's this and it's like you can't live in that world of constant like oh man what are we going to do oh man what are we going to do you can't do that yeah well also the, it seems to me like we were talking about the FBI it seems like the you know the FBI and other alphabet agencies out there are trying to push people's buttons and push certain people in certain directions deliberately right um so you know there were the guys who um got into this whole thing because they were going to try to kidnap the uh, a governor right and then when they came to find out there was fbi agents uh, there was a female agent sleeping with one of these guys and you know there's all kinds of weird things going on there i think those guys actually got off because they were basically entrapped into this whole thing, right? Or it may, it may be in process now, but I know a lot of weird shenanigans are coming out of the woodwork here. Don't let these guys push you in a direction and use you or pull your strings and make you do things. Exactly, man. I, I'm not afraid of them. Like they're to me, to me, they're just they're just goons. I mean, they're, they're or or soy boy little betas. I mean, they're like these, these are people that that can't do anything. I mean, all they have is their little tech, and all they have is is like some little hard on for people that believe in the United States of America. So, my advice to people out there, and this is with any government agency, if you're ever approached or if they ever like, just don't talk to them. I mean, do not interact with them. Do not talk with them. They're not your friend. They're not your ally. Uh, don't even talk to them. Don't don't respond. Don't do anything. Uh, like they live in a world of, of, of negativity and they live in a world of uh, somebody's always guilty of something and all you have to do is start talking. So, mm-hmm. you know, just don't, don't They, they always try to push your buttons and make you think that you're a hero. Um, I remember uh, the guy, Mike Deddy, who uh, wrote the book. He wrote some books about, uh, you know, where they were gun running, where the ATF was gun running and selling guns uh, to Mexican uh, gang members and stuff like that and was going across the border and he did it because he wanted to be a hero and he, he was a marine you know and they pushed those buttons of oh this is for your country and in the end they turned on him this is how it goes down let me just say this uh svee waldman is in the chat and he says <laughs> uh hi thanks for the shout out read so there you go svee waldman sees me, sees me when i when i get a camera in my face i, I build you up See? <laughs> there you go. Thanks for uh, joining us here over on the Utreons. If people want to know, man, this is my way of like when YouTube, YouTube actually got like had a, a meeting with a whole bunch of the, the big YouTubers and myself. And they were like, yeah, we're not going to let you hold guns when you go live. This is kind of my way of pushing back against that. I could talk to Reed for like probably 10 hours and not even talk about guns. But this Which is my way. Many times. Absolutely, yeah. This is my way of saying, "Hey, you can't tell me what to do," and I'll I'll go off and do it on some obscure thing, Utreon in this case. But we, you know, we can uh, we can make it, and we have to plan alternatives as well. I think a lot of the stuff that we see happening in society, they're going to come for us from every single direction. So we need to be ready. Um, uh, BB King Black says, "Read why no cigar tonight." Uh, you spark it up I had, well I'll tell you why because uh-huh. I had 
I've already had uh, three today. I had one this morning, one after I mowed the lawn, and right before the podcast, I had an A-size Lito Gomez uh, three-and-a-half-hour cigar that was a double Lee Garrel. So I figured if I had one right now, I'd be a little bit buzzed. <laughs> three? Okay. Yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. You're going hardcore. Have you ever done any of those podcasts with the guys who are into cigars and stuff? Have you ever... No, I haven't. No. Oh, okay. My uh, one of my friends is cigars and guns. Uh, he's real cool. Maybe I can I can link you up with him. Uh, he's he's a good guy. And then also, of course, Kevin Dixie. You know, he's a big cigar smoker too. So I've only ever smoked a cigar once, man. I did this uh, thing with Brownells in Utah where we were like climbing around in the mountains and repelling. And I almost died. It was just just walking mm-hmm. around. I was not in shape for it. And I told those guys. <laughs> You know, if I survive this, if you don't have to medevac me out of here, <laughs> I'll smoke a cigar with you. It's like a little baby. A little baby oh, yeah, cigar. you're good, man. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me see what other questions we have. Uh, Night Train says, uh, does Reed think that he is on the radar of the FBI and other alphabet agencies? Of course, you fall into the FBI's definition of what a bad guy is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, if maybe, maybe not. I... I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I figured if, if I was, uh, you know, I would uh, – look, if I'm not, then I don't think anybody would be, uh, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, my, my hat is on the list, you know. Uh, <laughs> Do you really – so, you know, so obviously what we're talking about, if people don't know, is uh, I think the some FBI memo that came out there, um, and it's, I, guess, I guess they were saying that folks who – uh, believe in the Gadsden flag, who fly that, the Betsy Ross flag, if you're pro, if you're pro Second Amendment, you're in the middle, it's all kinds of things. <laughs> like, pretty much any patriot out there, you're on the list. <laughs> you're the guys we're looking out for. Um, did that make yeah, you mad, funny. or do you, do you even get triggered by this kind of stuff? But there's a lot of this coming out. Some of it is just for the views and the hits and all that, but what do you think about it? You know, it's, I'll tell you a, a metaphorical story. I, I taught uh, when I was teaching high school. It was um, I was one of a few male teachers. I mean, there weren't many male teachers in the school. Maybe a handful of us, and it, I would say certainly ninety to ten, like ninety percent women to ten percent men. Mm-hmm. That were teachers. and so right next to me was the English department, and like the English department is like, and look, you guys know. I mean, women is like half of our you know Mm -hmm. species so it's nothing personal it's just Mm -hmm. when you get like an entire english department of women Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh our history department was entirely men and i was like the new teacher and so uh i'm not like this guy that's going to be all sensitive and and all this and i would just talk to them like normal human beings so Mm -hmm. i remember hearing rumors or something like from the other teachers that that they just weren't big fans of mine and we um and it was I never even had like a crossword like we never had an argument like we so the la- the ladies weren't big fan of Reed or the dudes the the, the ladies I got along fine with a guy okay so uh-huh. that that's like the story of my life so uh-huh. so the, the yeah it goes all the way back to like junior high but anyway my, my, uh, my life is the opposite of that the ladies always <laughs> like Hank Strange man. Well, how could they not look the at dudes, you, man? You're the like <laughs> the dudes so, are always jealous, but the ladies. And no, I'm just messing. Oh I'm yeah, messing with you. It, was these, it was one of these. things where you know we had this. Um, we had this like faculty like uh, holiday party coming up that night, and so it kind of upset me because I was like, you know, I never said anything against these people, and they're like trying to, you know, talk yeah. trash or whatever. So I was kind of upset about it because like I don't, I don't understand sometimes. So. But then a, a, a teacher, a real cool guy, real cool uh, guy about a little bit older than me, mm-hmm. and I told him kind of what happened. I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to go to this faculty party because I don't, you know, I don't want to run into these people if if they're, you know, their dollar doings running me down. And he kind of looks at me and he kind of like he kind of he kind of this uh, not a smirk but more of a kind of a smile, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, there's a lot of people here you probably don't want saying nice things about you. Mm. Interesting. So, okay. if, you know, so if, yeah. if, if certain people are saying good things about you, that tells you about. You what know, does it mean? It, yeah. 
Yeah. So so it's like, all right, cool. I, and I kind of I kind of perked up. I was like, all right, yeah, I'll go now. Yeah, yeah. So kind of with the um, with the symbols and with the bet, you know, the Betsy Ross flag and the mm-hmm. Gadsden flag and all mm-hmm. the other flags and and all that stuff. If if there's a certain group in this country that uh, is going to talk bad about people wearing that kind of stuff, I you know, I probably don't want them, you know, saying good things about us either. Yeah. So, you know, one of the th- one of the things I would say first of all. Um, you know, as a guy who has spent time studying the ladies, one of the things I would say is this to you, Reed. Why are you laughing, man? What are you laughing about? It's the, it, was the, it was the accent. <laughs> you know, look, I could tell you, man, this goes all, this is primordial. You know, when women don't like you, that's, that's not really true. When they say they don't like you, they actually like you. And I think that that's really true. You know, when they say that what we do is like toxic mas- masculinity, okay, I, I think there's a, there's some element of that but really and truly women want men to be men okay now you might get some women who because of their how they went to school you know where they grew up or whatever their sensibilities they you know don't like strong men but that's what they say that's what they say outside of the of their mind but inside their mind women want a strong man a woman wants a man who could support men want strong women for that matter like who wants a weak woman if you're a man and you want your woman to be weak that's an indication of something that's wrong with you and if you're a woman that you want your man to be weak that is also an indication of something being wrong with you oh yeah it, and you know that's it for you younger guys out there watching this would listen like just be a dude like go lift heavy things you know go shoot guns um, you don't know how to change a freaking tire just normal stuff like that. And you're going to be head and shoulders above like all the rest of your peers in your age group. And, you know, um, you know, I, I just, I can't emphasize that stuff enough. And, uh, it, it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's good insights on your end, Hank, man. It's, yeah. it's good stuff. They probably liked you, man. They probably liked you. And I'll also say this, you know, I'll also say this. There are a lot of women out there that try to break any kind of guys that they're into. So in other words, they like a guy. He might be he might be a good macho guy, or whatever. They try to break him, right? They try to get him to break. But the minute that he breaks, they actually lose all respect for him. Now, I'm not I'm not a super uh, chauvinist or anything like that. I don't I don't believe you should abuse women. I think women are in lots of ways more powerful than men, right? Men and women. But like a woman is not just a differently shaped man or completely different creatures. Women have their powers and their abilities and even their weaknesses. And us as men, we have our powers and abilities and weaknesses. But one thing I I could tell you that I've seen from women that if they could break you, if they can make you do things that you don't want to do, they have no respect for you, man. They're happy to do it, but they all have no respect for you either. Oh yeah, man. Pa- pass the test. Just be a dude. Like pass, pass yeah. the pass the little test. And guys out there, like don't don't like false advertise yourself. If you're a dude that's gonna wear flannel and have a beard, at least have like know how to cut down a tree and split wood. <laughs> if you've never done that, then you can't wear flannel or have the beard. Like that's how it works. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just putting on some Timberlands doesn't make you badass. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, life is so weird. <laughs> life is so weird. Um, let me let me get off this particular subject. Uh, Jade Grew says, "Is Reed gonna make a Utreon account?" Uh, I'll let you answer that. I think you just found out about Utreon today. I, I literally just found <laughs> out about it, and it's like, you know, um, if I upload stuff and then it like automatically uploads it to another platform, then yeah, because. That's easy, but you know, if I've got to like individually do it, it takes a lot of time. I don't do a lot of videos. I mean, I may do one like once a week or like once every other week, but I, I'm like way too busy to be like a consistent social media guy. Um, like I just mowed like freaking ten acres today. You know, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to be teaching Thursday and Friday. I got a private class coming in, and so I'm going to be doing that. And so it's like I don't like I don't have a lot of of time to spend on the internet and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, I was talking to Reed about it behind the scenes here before we started. Um, I think it's a good thing because, yes, you could sign up for Utreon and then they'll do everything, bring everything over automatically. So you don't necessarily have to do anything. But on the flip side of that, I would say that 
you know, we all have to figure out how to participate in something. There's no guarantee that Utreon's going to make it. There's been a lot of things, right? We had Full 30, we had Gunstreamer, we had this thing, we had that thing, all these different alternatives. But if we don't participate in these things, we're not going to help to build them up. And then when we really need them, they probably won't be around. But we are running a danger of, uh, of being like virtually silenced by a lot of activist corporations out there. And we have to do things about it. We're seeing, um, I was talking about it last night, there's companies that won't ship stuff from gun, from gun manufacturers. Or gun companies, right? They won't. They won't ship. There's credit card companies that won't allow credit card transactions to go through that have to do with gun manufacturers. And obviously, YouTube and social media has already come after us as gun folks, or just for people who believe what we believe. We've got to get ready for that. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> pretty wild, you know. If I, uh, you know, had a channel you know, teaching uh, young boys how to put makeup on, they'd probably promote me to trending on the front page of YouTube. But because, you know, we talk about uh, the principles of this country, natural rights, you know, we talk about things that have substance and that actually uh, truly empower an individual, that that's seen as, as dangerous. But you know what? Um, that is not going to change a single thing on, on how we do things. We're still going to put out good content for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so all, all the ways. I'll, I'll work on Reed. I'll work on Reed. I mean, this guy doesn't even use his phone all the time. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> My phone is a, is a jitterbug flip phone. It really is. That's not a... <laughs> you sent me the link before the show. I was like, I, I, I don't get from the phone. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Cause... Yeah. It's awesome, man. It's literally, yeah. literally like right here, man. Like this, this you, is were born, you were born out of your timeline, dude. Yeah. Man, like, I had one of those. I had one of those like 20 years ago. Oh, this is like my new phone. This is an upgrade for my uh, old yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. I used to have the 3G, but it didn't work anymore. Oh, so is that 4G? What is that one? I think so. Is it 4G? Yeah, she says it's 4G. Oh, okay. <laughs> We are on 5G now. We... Oh, I'm not, I'm not this, cool enough for that. No, this is why I love you, man. No, you got to be you. Everyone has to be them. We all can't <laughs> be the same. Don't, but, but, and also, don't spend all your life on uh, social media, man. I spent, I spend a lot of time on social media because I have to. And when I don't have to, I'm not on it. <laughs> Bro, if I have a choice, I'll spend like the vast majority of time underwater diving because that is like one of my favorite things to do in the world. Really? Okay. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, that's we learned something new. Uh, last time I think it was wrestling. I was looking yeah. forward. To, yeah, I was looking forward to you wearing your purple uh, uh, Macho Man Randy Savage shirt. I uh, just took that off before I got in front of the camera and then put this one on. It's oh. literally. I was watching a uh, <laughs> special on uh, the Altamont Rock Festival back in 1969. I had the Macho Man shirt on, and then I said, "Oh man, I'm going on." A podcast with my good buddy, and so I better put on something professional. Oh, <laughs> no, I would have been fine, but you know, it's all good. We're glad you're here. That's really what counts. All right, so yeah. we're about we're about to take another break here. We're going to take that break. If you guys have questions or whatever, let us know now. With Arms List, you can shop the extensive list of local and nationwide firearms classified. Now with more confidence because of their built-in firewall. For only $6.99 a month for personal use or $30 a month for business vendors. So when you're in the market, please consider Arms List. We wouldn't be able to keep the Who Move My Freedom podcast going without the support of great companies like Arms List. So um, let me see here. I'm going to get some of the comments. I just need to pull these comments. Let me see. All right. BB King Blanc says, uh, guys, FYI, Alito Gomez, who Reed mentioned, makes some of the strongest cigars in the world. I'm talking knock you on your butt straw. <laughs> really? That was the one that was three and a half hours. It was an A-size cigar. So I smoked that one for three and a half hours down to the nub, and that was the third one of the day. So that, that mm -hmm. answers that's why I'm not having one right now. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. My my friend Josh also from Brownells. I don't know if I don't know if you know that many of the Brownells crew. I know you're not like you know you don't know too many people in the firearms industry like but um my friend Josh from Brownells actually lives in Nicaragua now and he's a part owner of a cigar manufacturer out there so nice. Yeah. 
Uh, nice. You know. How did you get into the whole cigar thing? Let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> I had a buddy, you know, and he one day he came over and he had a, like a Tupperware, his old school like Tupperware container, and he had a bunch of them in there, and like he just started passing them out, and I said I'll try one of them, and mm-hmm. uh, that was like two thousand and five, two thousand six, somewhere in there. Okay, all right, so it's been going on for a while. Yeah, I was... it yeah, not constantly, but I would say that was like the genesis of it. Okay, I don't know if you got into that in, when you were in the Marines. Do you ever talk no. about that? How did you wind up in the Marines, man? Like, uh, how, how did that go? Was that like a family thing that you, folks in your family were in the Marines? How did that go? No, this is like pre-9-11. So like hard, I mean, they didn't have the like, uh, like after 9-11, like a lot more guys went in. But th- during that time, like if you went in the military and it was like, why, why would you go to college? And why wouldn't you go to college? I was like, I'm so done with school. And, and you know, I just wanted to go in and. Um, I checked out all the branches. It wasn't like I was 100% focused in on the Marines, but I went and checked out all the other branches, and um, the Marines sounded exactly like what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, do combat MOS. I, you know, I wanted to learn cool tactics. I wanted to learn how to shoot. I wanted to um, do something that nobody else was doing in my school. I, I was the out of a high school of 1,200 people. I was the only one that went in the Marine Corps in that oh, class. Oh, wow. Where was your high school? I don't know if you talk about that. Uh, where'd you go to high school? I went to high school in uh, Peoria, Illinois, called Richwoods High School. Okay. All right. Peoria, Illinois. That's like old school American. You know? Yeah, it used, to be, it used to be a nice <laughs> town. It's, uh, it's a little rough these days, but back when I was there, it was uh, pretty good stuff. Did, do your people go back to the Mayflower? Like, where, where do the Henricks come from? <laughs> it depends on which side of the family that you're talking uh-huh. about. Because, uh-huh. Because my mother's side, you know, it goes all the way back to the highlands of Scotland. I mean, we, mm-hmm. we've, I've been able to trace it back to the to the ninth century, you know, the highlands. Uh, so on that side of the family, we're definitely uh, Scottish. And then, uh, you know, so they come mostly from Scotland and, and uh, England and, uh, you know, that part of the British Isles. Mm-hmm. And on my dad's side, a little bit uh, murky because uh, my great-grandfather was actually adopted. So my last name, hmm. it may not have even, it wasn't like his real last name. So, ah. you know, that, the family's a little bit murky. So uh, I know there's like on the, my, that's a little bit of German, but I don't have any German DNA on me at all. Like I thought I did, but right. I have none. Like I've checked all that stuff, like zero German DNA. So, so Henrix, Henrix is would be a German name. It's a German last name. Yeah, but that wasn't my great grandfather's real he, last name. Yeah, he and was we adopted. We, okay. He was adopted, so we don't know. Like he was adopted into a Henrix family, but that's mm-hmm. not like, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> that's not his bloodline. So, did you ever do genetic tests? What do you think about that? I know there's a lot of people that won't do them because the guy. I, I, okay. I did it a long time ago before all that mm-hmm. stuff started mm-hmm. happening. So it's like um, mm-hmm. I figured out. I was like, oh man, I'm all German. I got all this German. at zero, like zero. <laughs> you know, like, oh. Yeah, that um, happens. And yeah. I have all this. Like, Pride before I'm like yeah well man and then, I, and then I, figured, I was like I'll go to Bavaria one day and throw down some Hefe Bison yeah yeah Oktoberfest uh, oh yeah I was gonna go there for Oktoberfest and all that stuff and then I figured and then I did the the DNA thing I was like there's no German DNA and so it was like all right well like sometimes you just never know so so other than the English like the Scottish English you know UK stuff that what what else yeah. was in there was uh, a, a little bunch bit of stuff? Norwegian okay. yeah Norwegian uh mm-hmm. Ashkenaz and Sephardic Jew uh mm-hmm. and then like a bunch like uh, mostly like Scandinavian and British Isles and then yeah okay okay yeah that's cool you know what's fun I think that's probably something we have in, in common my last name which I don't really talk about was not my last name either you know my dad was um okay. it's like a weird thing my my dad his mother was ma- she had a husband okay but that wasn't who his father is. <laughs> so she had a family, like a husband and kids and everything. And then his dad had a wife and kids and everything. <laughs> wow, so, man. It's so, interesting. It? When you actually <laughs> dig into it and find out, you're like, yeah. whoa, I never... Yeah, so he was like born. So his mom carried him, obviously. This is how they used to do it in the olden days. Before you got assigned female, you know that bullshit? <laughs> they talk yeah. about, uh, like, if you were assigned female at birth, whatever. So his mom carried him, gave birth to him, and then literally took him and gave him to her sister, 
who had like her own husband and kids and everything, but they raised him like on some Harry Potter type stuff where wow. they raised him and everything, but they kind of, you know, they didn't treat him really like a son. Um, they treated him more like a, like a servant and stuff like that. So his last name's not his real last name and all that. And it, it, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Oh yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. And it, so yeah, it's cool. But, but my yeah. family, like, especially on my mom's side has been in the United States since the 1500s. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they fought, uh, they fought in like every single war. I mean, every single one, like it's, uh, that, that line of my family is like some fighting people. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of crazy. It's, it's interesting because like, even like, so all my, my government name, you know, that we're not going to discuss here, the government name is all Irish or Scottish. That's what it is. Every single. I can I can see, I can see the resemblance, yeah. right? <laughs> right, exactly. So the one I did. So I always thought, okay, there's got to be some kind of Scottish blood or something in here. My dad actually has gray eyes, and so I was like, okay, there's got to be something. No, did the genetic test? I am African, which is my dad's all African. <laughs> that's all that's in there. My mom's Indian, so there's Indian. My mom had more of a genetic mix on her side, like being Indian, there was Chinese, there's even like Iranian and, and different things there in her blood. And it's like, yeah, a lot of people, you have names and you think that somehow your heritage has to do with your name. No, it has nothing sometimes to do with yeah, it. Yeah, a lot of the time it has, it has no bearing whatsoever on where your family is from. Yeah. So in the Marines, to get back to it, you went into the Marines. You were in there like what four years? You said. Yep, did four years, and um, was it good? So, did you enjoy it? Not enjoy it? <laughs> I enjoyed certain parts of it, but I would say like, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed uh, certain parts. Like some, like a lot of the friends in my life to this day, I still talk to, and it's over twenty years. I mean, I've been out twenty years, so. You know, it's um, I still talk to those guys, and I and I, I, in fact, I just had a friend last week come with his entire family. He just retired as a first sergeant after 23, 24 years in. So, um, he he was amazing. He and his family came here for like a week, and we had a good time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of the guys that I served with, I'm still very good friends with, and um, so yeah, those are the best parts of it. Was was the guys that I that I did serve with my friends that I still talk to to this day. Okay, what was the worst part of being in the Marines? Do you think? Um, probably like the stupid people in charge. Okay, <laughs> I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what that, that's how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't any of the physical stuff. I mean, right. I you know I've always been a guy that's that's like stayed in shape and been in shape and like was able to run and. Like do it, so that start that part was easy. Like the hikes, like all yeah. that stuff. Being out in the field. That, yeah, that you seem like not. you have ADHD or something, man. You seem like you don't you don't wind down easy. No, no, I don't. <laughs> that, I just I'm actually a very hyper focused person when I stay right. on top and stays on there, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, uh, you know, the physical stuff was easy. The uh, academic stuff was easy. Um, being in charge of stuff was easy. Uh, the, obviously the, the shooting, the tactics was easy to pick up. So that stuff was all easy. I got promoted very fast, actually. I, um, you know, I made sergeant three and a half years in 0351, and anybody that was in during that time period, especially the size of the Marine Corps at the time, will know that's not an easy thing to do with, with no meritorious promotion, by the way. That was just strictly performance-based. So it um, it was something else. And, and But none of that stuff was, was hard. The hardest part was just listening to a lot of the imbeciles in charge and, and just the way that they trained us and the way that they did things. I always promised if I was ever in a position where I could help people train and learn this kind of stuff with the weapons and tactics, I always vowed to do it vastly differently than what I was taught. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. I see that uh, BB King Bond says tonight the Liz Cheney, uh, Liz Cheney should lose her race yeah i'm not tracking it i don't i don't know if you're tracking that kind of stuff no man they, yeah. they i think she like a three percent chance of winning or something like that she had a three percent chance of winning three percent chance of winning yeah wow okay so that should be like a landslide on the highest the highest pull on her i saw was she was down 22 points oh wow okay yeah you know i obviously i've heard of liz shady and i've seen all the crazy stuff going on i didn't realize until last night when I was talking on the podcast with the guys about it, that she's related to Dick Cheney. I didn't even realize. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Wonderful family. They they're really <laughs> into some awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. Interesting. Isn't it weird? Like I remember the uh the the W Bush year. I remember the Bush years period. Um, you know. So like I got out of high school in eighty eight, you know. Uh so the Bush years are definitely in my mind. It's weird how that like all those people from that kind of thing it's all flipped around, right? It's kind of like those used to be the the kind of like Republican royalty. I don't know what's the way to say it, man. Like, you know, those guys all thought they had rights to be president and everything. But on the left, they hated him. Now they love him. I don't. It's it's weird. Well, they they kind of like gravitate toward each other. And when yeah. and when greed, when greed and um, destruction of, of the country's values. I mean, look at what W. Bush did to this country. I mean, he. Patriot Act, like, come on, like that's mm-hmm. that's the worst, one of the worst pieces of legislation that we're still having to suffer under. I mean, he uh, he ran it to get elected in two thousand. I mean, he he ran on a platform of non intervention and in fiscal responsibility and not getting us involved overseas, and like mm-hmm. that's what he ran on to become president. And then literally, like, not even two years into the deal, like he, now we're like you know getting involved in all kind of stuff and and passing the patriot act and spending all kinds of money and mm-hmm. um he did the opposite of what he said to do and, and what he said he was going to do so I, i'm definitely not a fan of his and those are corporate his- corporate republicans you know corporate politicians for that matter um i al- always found it interesting i don't know if you ever saw the joe rogan with snowden where snowden yeah. said that the, after the patriot act there was there there is no constitution <laughs> Yeah, it's a bad thing. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we had the Republican House, Republican Senate, and the Republican President in 2017 to 2019, and that stuff mm-hmm. didn't go away, did it? Yeah, no, no. And let's see here. Uh, Night Train says, the only good thing George W. Bush did was let the so-called assault weapons ban expire and his father nominating Clarence Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, uh, Clarence Thomas is a good thing from Daddy Bush, but then W. He, he really didn't do anything. <laughs> he just didn't put the pen to the paper. Yeah, so, so pr- probably Dick Cheney was running most of that, you know. <laughs> God, what a you know. And then, he, and then he shot his hunting buddy in the freaking. Uh, he shot his hunting buddy when they went out to uh, upland yeah. game hunting. He just tacked a round off into. Yeah, that's bad gun handling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen. Yeah. You know, stuff could happen, but, you know, this is why you have to have, uh, take some kind of care of what you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You have to take some kind of care yeah. of what you do. Uh, so let's see what else, uh, what else is going on, man? Um, I'm trying to see what other stuff people are looking at. People are probably looking at those politics. What states are there, stu- uh, are there, um, are there things running in right now? Let's see. I've got everyone is talking about their family and where their fa- uh, bloodline goes. So oh, cool. Ar- Armin and Axis says, "I have ancestors on my mom's side that came over on the second crossing of the Mayflower." There you go. And uh, also related to Kellogg of Kellogg Food Company. Okay, there you go. And uh, <laughs> Cruise Man says, "My mom family can my mom's family can be traced back to the Salem witch trials." Oh, that's old school there. Yeah, some, some Puritan. <laughs> yeah, I purify have... the purify the Church of England. <laughs> I've got a friend. I call him Bubba Roadkill on here, and uh, you know, I live in the Gainesville area, and his family, they on both of his mother's side and his father's side, they both came over on the Mayflower. And so that, that's old school, man. That that's definitely yeah. some old school stuff. And I mean, but if you think what brought those people. Uh, mm-hmm. Over here was was persecution. Uh, they wanted, they they saw a situation where they could no longer remain where they were, mm-hmm. uh, and live the life that they wanted to live. So, um, they they came here. I mean, because they wanted to live uh, according to how they saw fit. That would go into the whole pursuit of happiness thing. And um, you know, those people came over. But what I find fascinating talking about family lineage with a lot of different people, and I've got friends of all different backgrounds. But what I find it so interesting is people really love knowing uh, where they came from but I, I've maintained this for years and we've talked about this when you were here in person mm-hmm. uh, we may have all come from a lot of different places but there's one thing that unites people better than any other thing on the planet and that's freedom mm-hmm. I think um, freedom is going to unite people more than anything nobody likes being told what to do there may be people that like to tell others 
what to do, but nobody truly likes being told what to do. And freedom unites people. And uh, it's one of the things that I will maintain that is if your principles of freedom are there and you stay consistent with them, uh, then it's a beautiful life. So, you know, when we, when we get outside of that freedom index, when we get outside of the freedom matrix, right? People get outside of it. And, and it's like, my thing is, is, is live your life according to your principles. Don't infringe on the rights of others. Uh, and, and, and live it with consistency because that's what it's all about, man. And I mean, you see people that want to claim to be, you know, Republicans, conservatives, but they'll be the first one to use the government against their political enemies. Well, we accuse the other side of the same thing, but just simply like leave other people alone. Like that's really what it boils down to leave other people alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and your life. I'm, I'm a big fan of Ron Paul. Like Ron Paul is one of my favorite politicians of all time. Like, Mm -hmm. I I don't know how he didn't get the nomination in 2008, Mm -hmm. but, um, I certainly yeah. voted for in the primary, so... We need know, something Paul- like that now. I think I saw you somewhere talking about you're more of a libertarian-leaning person, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I am. I am, certainly. You know, I'm, I'm, I would say, I, like, I've heard, you know, people describe it libertarian, but, I, but on, like, a lot of issues, like, social issues, I'll lean more conservative. But in terms of government policy, right? Like, in terms of, like, government policy, it's, like, libertarian, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but my personal... My personal beliefs are one thing, but I would never implement my personal beliefs on somebody else's life. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, man. Uh, as long as people aren't trying to take things from me or hurt, you know, you could do what you want to do as long as you're not taking things from people that don't belong to you and you're not hurting people uh, and then you're not going after people who have no way of defending themselves. You know, that would be children. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. These sure, man. Like that, yeah. That's it. That's it, dude. And that's that's one fight that I will stand on um is is protecting other people mm-hmm. and uh you know that's the thing i mean it, it, i've always been a protector of other people and uh i've always tried to be and you know we, we've got to look out for each other and have each other's backs I'm a, I'm a big believer in that and um you know there's a lot of stuff that that we do there's a lot of things that that my guys do people on my cadre do that goes behind the scenes that we don't really seek out recognition for. They work tirelessly. They work hard on advancing the second amendment, certainly from a legislative and political standpoint, Mm -hmm. but we got to watch each other's back on that kind of stuff. And I think it's very important to do that. Yeah. We don't have to get credit for everything, man. Uh, One of the things I believe in life is that there are, I, I guess you could put it like angels or whatever. There are entities aware of what we do, good and bad. You know, uh, I think we all do bad things, and we just have to be aware of that and and try to be better. But there, you know, there are entities that are aware of what we're doing, but not, you know, we don't have to go out of our way to make other people know what we do. We just need to do good things for each other. Oh yeah, for sure, man. Like that. That's it. And you know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you looking back on stuff and looking over the last several years, just just looking at. Uh, the amazing things that have happened. I mean, mm-hmm. because it's not just bad things that happen over the last decade or five years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not bad things that happen. There's a lot mm-hmm. of good things that happen too. But mm-hmm. I really like people to start emphasizing those over over the other. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, man. And one of the things I think you said it earlier. We need to make sure that we keep each, like we hold each other up i think i'm probably saying it in a different way but don't let your friends out there get miserable and get all caught up into this and get into stinking thinking and all that kind of stuff and and uh, you know and lose their way man or or um, get broken or lost and and do bad things it's our job to uphold our friends and keep them from losing it you know we're we're all going to need each other soon enough we don't have to push it yeah you do a, <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> don't don't wish your life away because one day it will be away. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take this break. We're going to come back in here um, and keep going. We wouldn't be able to keep the Who Move My Freedom podcast going without the support of a DAO or decentralized autonomous organization like Tusk Crypto. Tusk Cryptocurrency is a firearm friendly e-commerce option for online payment transactions secured on the blockchain. So when you're in the crypto market, please consider Tusk, T-U-S-C. No. All right. So let's see here. Um, I do want to talk about there's a letter I think. I was trying to send it to you, but as you said, your, your phone is not a smartphone. So there's a letter from the Smith & Wesson uh, CEO, which I'll get to it. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it up here and uh, read a little bit of it for people. Uh, that's one of the things happening that we could probably talk about unless you have something else. 
Um, Night Train said, the problem is the Libertarian Party is a joke. What would you say about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they could probably have a bigger uh, presence for sure. I mean, but the other thing is, is that it's uh, it's gained traction. I mean, it really has. Um, mm-hmm. it, it gained a lot of traction, but I think that, uh, you know, solidifying the platform around a few core issues would be a, a, a big way to go, uh, you know, especially downsizing government, especially getting rid of a lot of the agencies, especially personal, you know, privacy and things like that. I don't know too many people that wouldn't sign on to that, but I think a lot of people view libertarians as like, oh, there's these like guys that just smoke dope and, mm-hmm. you know, they want everybody to be able to do anything at any time. And it's like, well, it's, I mean, maybe some folks, but, uh, you know, I, not everybody. I think what's happened um, over the years, right, with the Libertarian Party, it's kind of been like a popularity contest. So to get anywhere in the party, you kind of have to be outrageous. And that is what's created this image that it's a joke. I think that they're trying to clear that up. Like we've had Spike Cohen on the show, who he ran as uh, for vice president uh a couple of years ago on the libertarian side and he started out doing those things like doing videos of him running shirtless on the beach or whatever stuff because you have to do that kind of thing and I think he's gotten a lot more serious but you know we have to we also have to play parts in these things right we can't always stand by and look look and wait for someone else to do it we have to take part in this and my question to you I know you probably you want to say something on that but my question to you after that would be, have you ever thought about, like, politics? No. No, I haven't. I, I, would, I would not do it because, first and foremost, um, you know, I, I am a teacher. I'm not somebody that's going to go uh, go into a place like Washington, D.C. and get frustrated. I mean, my, my thing is, like, I'm trying to, like, not go into a situation like that. I mean, can you imagine me face to face with AOC? (laughs) Do you think I'm just going to sit there and talk to her? Like I would like arm bar her into the tile floor. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I I just, well, first of all, I'd have her arrested for sedition. You know, I mean, that, Mm -hmm. that'd be the first thing I would do. And then, and then the second thing I would do would have the Sergeant at arms, put Nancy Pelosi in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's like, people say, well, yeah, Reed, you just talked about being a libertarian. I am a libertarian within the framework of the Constitution, and those people are absolute violators of it from the moment they raise their right hand. They violated their oath of office. They violated the Constitution. So, you know, the thing is, is that those people, uh, they're pretty dangerous. But no, I've never thought about going into politics. I, I just wouldn't even be happy with it. Um, my thing is, Hank, and I mean, I don't try to get morbid or anything like that, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My, my thing is, is that, you know, I realize the time of life you know, and then every year I look back on it and it just, it seems like just yesterday that I was 20 or it seems like just yesterday I was even 30. Hell, it seems like just yesterday I was 40. Mm-hmm. And the longer life goes on and I look back at it, the more I realize that, you know, the time that we have here is the time that we have here. And we're not guaranteed to all live to be 80, 85, 90. Like we're not all guaranteed to do that stuff. So, God willing, you know, I live to be 120 years old, <laughs> but, you know, I, I uh, hope you do. I hope you do. Everybody watching this does. I'm in, you know, mm-hmm. but the thing is, is like, it, you know, I don't know how much time is left, but whatever time is, is there, you know, I want to spend that time uh, helping other people uh, be proficient with firearms and, and tactics and training. I want to help people in terms of history. I want to help people, uh, you know, empower them. I'm really started to look at, mentoring younger guys out there and um, helping them figure out this thing we call life and help them separate BS from reality. You know, I really like, you know, helping younger people along the way now. Yeah. Uh, You know, I think we all have our parts to play in life, man. I I remember when I was five years old, when you were saying that, uh, I thought about that. Like, I remember being five years old and, you know, um, in a, in, in an airport in Guyana, you know, South America, walking across the tarmac to get up on the get on one of those uh ladders that goes up on the plane and uh leaving the country i was born in and here i am 50 years old man that's like 45 years goes by really fast and we all have a part to play you know we don't all have to be up front and get all the glory and all that kind of stuff we all have a part to play in life 
I think we should we should spend time. You know, the the folks out there that we think are good politicians, uh, who do believe in the Constitution, etc. We need to spend time vetting those people. You know, finding them, vetting them, and then supporting them and helping them get into office. You know, that's that's the stuff we need to do. Yeah, there's certain people built for it too. I mean, I'm not like. I'm not the most diplomatic person at times, you know, I'm really not. Uh, mm-hmm. And I recognize that, you know, it's, it's like we got to know where we're holding in life and we got to know where our strengths yeah. and weaknesses are and, and never like, you know, know your low end, know your high end and like never exceed either. So, you know, I, I know that uh, there's certain Life is not go- all about diplomacy all of the time, man. You know, there's, uh-huh. mom- there's moments, life is not always about diplomacy. There's sometimes oh, in life... Some people just, you know, there's time in life when we don't need some people on the planet with us. I know that sounds oh. harsh to people listening, but, I mean, it's reality. Yeah, I'm very fixed in, in my beliefs, uh, very mm-hmm. fixed in, in that and how I live my life. You know, I'm very fixed in that aspect of things. And, um, you know, I'm old enough to figure out uh, what is good and what's not good and what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. I'm old enough to, uh, to have reflected on that. Um, so... Yeah, there's people built for like being politicians, but there's also people that are not, and I'm certainly not one of those people that is. I mean, there, you know, being um, being able to help and influence people the way that I have been has been a good thing. I know a lot of people have asked me if I was going to run or that I should, and and all this and that. But uh, you know, quite honestly, uh, I, I don't know how much of my uh, spirit of life I could maintain having to be in Washington D.C. for any significant amount of time. I've never been there. I'd never want to go there. Um, I think it's evil. I think um, I think it's just a bad overall place. And uh, yeah, I, I would have no desire whatsoever to go there or be around the vast majority of people in Congress. Yeah. Um, so Lola has a question. She says, "Speaking of freedom, how did COVID restrictions affect training? And as as the uh, has the current economy affected class sizes?" So good question, yes. I think. Yeah. Let's uh, see now. Now we know. We now we know why she gets paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lola's <laughs> trying to be all like organized and and logical oh, and stuff. <laughs> I'm not talking yeah. that. It's it's almost like she has like an advanced degree or something. So um, absolutely. <laughs> so you know, it's a, it's 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 funny because uh, it, COVID didn't affect us at all. Uh, in fact, I never ever stopped teaching classes because uh, mm. I you know I I kind of. I'm not a medical expert by any means, but I also know BS when I hear it. And so when all the stories started coming out and seeing all this stuff, I was like, okay, yeah, that's that's not going to happen. So we, we did classes as normal. Didn't affect classes at all. Our, I had medical – I had physicians in class. I've had virologists in class. I've had cellular biologists in class. I've had epidemiologists in class. All the guys that, that would like – know way more about this stuff than I do. And when we talked about it, they all said it was bull crap. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to listen to people that have more knowledge than I do that, that like went to medical school for, for a long time. And when I heard it from them directly from them, I already had my suspicions. I always kind of thought it was bull crap. But when I heard it from them, that's when I knew that the jig was up. So we, we never stopped uh, teaching classes. We never did anything. Guys came here. I've never had a student wear a mask ever. I've, I've never even worn one myself this whole time. I've not worn one mm-hmm. and I just walk right into stores. If anybody says anything to me, I disacknowledge them as a human being and just keep <laughs> Nice. And so, yeah. so, you know, it's, it's like there, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take advice from somebody that's who's, whose BMI is 40 lecturing me on public health. Like, you know, like, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't be allowed to walk down the middle aisle of the grocery store. If, if, mm-hmm. if you don't think I should be able to come into a store. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I would never tell somebody that, but you know, that's what I'm thinking. So, mm-hmm. um, no, no, it didn't affect class sizes at all. Um, you did it. Did you have to travel anywhere? Did you, uh, did you do any traveling these last couple of years? Uh, mm-hmm. not, I mean, we don't do any training. We don't do any classes on the road. So we, okay. I, I'm a, just on a personal level. Yeah. I've been, I've been all over the country except, mm-hmm. I mean, there's places I don't go. Like I don't go to the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I've been to the Midwest. I've been, to the southwest i've been all over the southeast yeah we i've traveled i mean if you're gonna dive man you gotta go to where the ocean water is so um 
yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so so things. did you did you get on a plane or anything like that i know i got on a plane a couple of times and i had to Bro. had to put on the mask and there's obviously like going to the doctor and stuff like that you had to do the mask oh no yeah. i don't i don't i don't do air travel okay yeah i'm with well that's why i got the van man i got sick and tired of of all the bs that you have to go through to get on a plane and all that and i said you know i'm just gonna travel around and and go, go places in my own time so yeah i know yeah. for a long time you don't really do the air the air travel thing no i won't i will not do it again until they get rid of the tsa okay all right yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not a criminal. Don't treat me like one. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, we have a Fourth Amendment for a reason, and um, just because they don't respect it, that uh, that doesn't mean that we have to tolerate it. And so I, I vote with my wallet, and uh, I will not do any air travel. I wish the whole country would have done that the moment the Patriot Act was signed. I, I wish that the whole country would have would have ceased air travel, and I bet that that would have ceased pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, yeah, we need to defund air travel, man. The, look, I, I could tell you that I remember getting on a plane to go somewhere two years ago. And, um, you know, maybe this was even like a year and a half, something like that. And they were, I think it was American Airlines. And they were like, if you don't comply with this, with wearing the mask, not only will we kick you off this flight, we'll ban you from ever getting on a flight ever again. And I was like, yeah. what the, like we're, I'm the person keeping you guys going. Right, you're yeah. around because we're giving you money. Always right, you know, yeah. customers yeah. always right. Unless it's the government, then they, they, then they, then they're always right. But, you know, the thing is, it's like, um, it's, yeah, but no, I don't travel. We've never done that. And as far as uh, business, mm -hmm. um, no, nah, I mean, normally like classes would be like sold out like a year in advance, but now it's like we're sold out like several months in advance. Mm. Okay. All right. So. Um... Okay, that's that's good to know. So I know people are asking; they want to they want to see uh, some Gorn from you, which is basic basically gun porn. Uh, so now that it's nice and dark, I could I could see. Yeah. I know you have something there. That was, <laughs> yeah, good now, time. now you're going by candlelight, literally. Oh, kerosene lamps is what we're going by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, what yeah, you got? What, what do you have for the people, Reed? <laughs> what well, do you want to what do you want to show them? What do you what do you want to show? I, I don't, them? I mean, I typically don't want to show anybody any of my guns. But, <laughs> I know, I yeah. know. And the last time I was talking to you about this behind the scenes, the last time you were on, uh, we ha I, we were on YouTube, I remember, and I was like, hey, you know, they don't want us to hold any guns. And you're like, okay, cool. And then we were just talking for a long time, and something I said to you, like, oh, let me show you how I carry right here. And the, the minute you pulled up, I switched away from it, and I was like, oh, no, I, I wonder if they saw that. Like what was it? Like thirty seconds or something? They pulled it. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I mean, I I run basic stuff. Everybody like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody wants to. Oh man, you teach firearms for a living. You must have all kind of guns. And I'm like, dude, you'd be like shocked at the guns I don't have. I know uh, you got a Gucci Glock over there somewhere. Come on, don't. A Gucci one? Yeah, like as Gucci. far as like, your, like a fancy. My, my every my yeah. everyday carries the Gen Three with iron sights. Uh, you know, I, that's what I run most of the time. Or I run a twenty six with iron sights. So I've got, I'm carrying one right now. Uh, I just run a. Uh, there you go. Look at that. Six. Look at that freedom. You know, see nothing's. Move it over into the light a little bit the other way. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Yep. Iron sights, Glock twenty six. Simple. Um, I don't yeah, see lasers. Stuff. I don't see red dots. I don't see yep. uh, any kind of special automatic targeting implements or anything on there. What's happening? You know, the thing is, is that you can't shoot irons well. You, you can't shoot any of that other stuff well. So, uh, uh -huh. you know, my, my thing is that none of that stuff helps you shoot better. Um, it's so, so I'm, I'm more of a, a, a traditionalist when it comes to that. I think learning on irons helps you. I think learning iron sights is, is the way to go to start with. Um, I got some guys will say, oh, well, you'll get faster results like if you use optics. I'm like, well, you may get faster like right away results, but you're not going to develop yourself the way you would if you started on irons and. This has proven true time and time again. I've seen him in, in over the several years, so um, I always stick with irons. I, when I do a class, I always shoot demos with with my iron sighted rifles. Um, I, uh, you know, when I shoot pistol, it's always iron sights. My everyday carry pistol is, is iron sights because um, they're just reliable. They work for me, and I know that it, uh, I can make good shots with it. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of people in class with red dots? Though I think uh, they're getting more popular. They're getting more popular, but but what people soon realize is that uh, it doesn't help you shoot any better. So, 
um, what, what they're what they're finding out is that you know a lot of people you know will find out that uh, we do see them like we've seen them more this last year than we have in years past. But um, a lot of people will uh, default. A lot of times they'll just go to the irons. Like I have a lot of people just stick with the iron sights. So just to show you about that, even with a rifle, like this is like thank you for my rifle. Like this is just my standard. I don't know if you can see it. Uh yeah, there you go, there you go. Is that uh what is that? It's a stag, sixteen inch. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So it's iron sights, uh, carrying handle, as you can see, yeah. carrying handle right here. Yeah. Um, simple light, you know, uh, easy stuff. Yeah, like polymer, this is, this polymer really handguard, man. Jeez, that's yeah. old school. Yeah, round mm -hmm. handguards. I mean, it's there. Yeah. But you know, it's funny because like a lot of guys are going back to the old school stuff now because. You've been in, you've been around firearms for a long time now, and mm -hmm. and you see the wheel kind of just goes round and round and round, and it's mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll just see these cycles continue. So what was popular ten years ago will come back in vogue, and then vice versa. So you see the wheel go round and round. My advice to people out there is find one system, stick with it, and and get good with it, and then get more consistent with it. And I think you're going to get a lot better results than if you just go from gun to gun to gun. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And of course, there's nothing wrong with. Uh you know, liking guns or collecting guns or whatever. That's what I do. I wanted to show oh. this off since you were here. This is like, this is kind of old school. This is a, All right. this is a Bushmaster. Let me see if I can get it. You see the snake on there? Oh, I dig it, man. Is that an old, <laughs> is that an older one or a newer one? Yeah, no, this is older. <laughs> this is an older, hey, run. <laughs> this is an older Bushmaster that I bought like years ago, man from a gun store that nobody wanted in there. I haven't done anything to it. I always said, oh, I'm gonna like take off that uh, muzzle. I'm gonna do, yeah, I haven't done anything to it. And even now, like Bushmaster's coming back around, man. Um, you know, Bushmaster, it's kind of coming back, kind of, sort of. Yeah, they, they, they're good, yeah. man. I, they, yeah. You know, that old school ones, you can't get them to quit. You know, the old school Bushmaster's run and run and run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bush, you know, um, I think we, this, we're dealing with technology that's old, no matter how you talk about it. So, like, so for example, um, have you heard of the What Would Stoner Do rifle? Probably not. The, the, oh, guy, I mean, maybe. the guys from Forgotten Weapons did this with the Brownells guys. So this, this is the lower here. It's a polymer lower, and it goes all the way back to the stock. So it's a fixed stock, polymer lower. This is what it, the, and so you could buy, you could get a complete gun or you could build your own gun. So this particular gun was built off of the uh, polymer lower that um, that KE Arms makes it, and it was developed by the guys from Forgotten Weapons and Brownells. And then this particular, I have like a magnesium Fostec upper on it. That's what I've got going on here. And then Liberty Suppressors that's been out there for a long time. I actually sent the upper off to them. And, the, and this is what they call the Zulu upper. So it's a 5.56 upper that has a titanium. Uh, they, they build in a uh, suppressor onto this. So it's an integral titanium suppressor. I like, I like integral guns, man. I'm just like a fan of that. And that's all new and fancy dancy and all that kind of stuff, you know. But I like it. Nothing wrong yeah, with that. Yeah. No, that's cool stuff, man. I mean, it, and, and they work. And... Um, there's there's good stuff happening. It kind of reminds me of the old school like cavalry arms. How they used to do that polymer. That's where too. this they came from. That. Yeah, that's an old school yeah. cav arms. Yeah. That's who originally made this a long time ago. But this is a they kind of like went back and redesigned it. So it's not exactly. There's a lawsuit going on right now. That the fact that you mentioned that. But uh, this is a completely new design that they did. And like you said, it's kind of going back to that old school stuff. That, uh... Yeah, I dig it, man. And there's always there's always beauty in blending the past with the present. Mm -hmm. I, I I think there's there's a lot of good stuff going on, and you know there, there's great innovation happening out there. But uh, guys will always find that what was once old will be new again, mm -hmm. and and they'll see those concepts. So a lot of the concepts that that guys are doing, they 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 look at some older designs and then make them even better. So it's kind of a cool thing. Absolutely. Um, we're we're gonna we're running into another break. It man, we are like just burning through time. It seems yeah. like it's only been like a couple minutes. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe we're... So we're going to take this break, and we're going to come right back. We'll get some more uh, questions and comments. The Who Moved My Freedom podcast is made possible by our partners at 2A Commerce. Veteran-owned and with over 20 years' experience, 
2A Commerce is the leader in custom e-commerce and web application development in the shooting sports industry. Clients include major brands such as Guard Dog Body Armor, Sylvan Arms, AccuFire Technologies, The Tactical Games, Warrior Knife Company, and yours truly, Hank Strange. Visit 2A Commerce and support this show by supporting them. Once again, visit the number 2acommerce.com. Yeah, Armament and Axis is saying, what would Stoner do? I, I think that's what I was saying, but who knows, man. I'm dyslexic, so sometimes I say crazy stuff, you know. Um, like a lot of the very creative, uh, genius people out there, I am dyslexic. Uh, let's see here. 42 Chill says, show the tank. Do you have a tank? A tank? Yeah, that would be awesome. Do you have I, one? I, I, I do not, actually. <laughs> okay, why not, man? You need a tank. <laughs> I just, you know, uh, thought about it, man, but then I figured there'd be, you know, where do you keep it, and, you know, but I do have the tank, I don't know where that's, maybe that's just the tank. Yeah, so Lola's reminding me I didn't do the Smith & Wesson thing, so I'm going to throw it up here. So you know that Congress, we were talking about Congress earlier, they're trying to get uh, some firearms manufacturers to come in front of Congress. I think Smith & Wesson was one of them. I believe Daniel Defense, and who else? I think it was Brownells as well. So it appears that Smith & Wesson, the CEO, has put out uh, a statement on all this. And I think this has been breaking the last 24 hours. I know I saw it. Uh, uh, Langley Outdoors was talking about it. And I think there's some other folks and other uh, 2A news publications that are putting it out there. So I'm just going to put it up now. I know you haven't seen it, Reed, so I'm going to try to go through it real quick. I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. Um, it says, for immediate release, Smith & Wesson CEO issues strong statement in the face of Second Amendment attacks amid an unprecedented and unjustified attack on the firearms industry Smith & Wesson Brands Inc. President and CEO Mark Smith responds Monday with the following statement it's a quote a number of politicians and their lobbying partners in the media have recently sought to disparage Smith & Wesson some have had the audacity to suggest that after they have vilified undermined and defunded law enforcement for years supported prosecutors who refused to hold criminals accountable for their actions, overseen the decay of our country's mental health infrastructure, and generally promoted a culture of lawlessness, Smith & Wesson and other firearm manufacturers are somehow responsible for the crime wave that has predictably resulted from these destructive policies. But they are the ones to blame for the surge in violence and lawlessness, and they seek to avoid any responsibility for the crisis of violence they have created by attempting to shift the blame to Smith & Wesson and other firearms manufacturers and law-abiding gun owners. And it goes on here. I could read the whole thing, but, you know, we'll try to, like, sure. digest that part of it. Uh, what do you think about these kinds of statements coming out from the firearms industry? I think it's great. Um, you know, they, they, they should – I mean, they finally realize that. I remember back in the uh, – early 90s smith took a much different tone during the uh, crime bill under the clinton administration so you know what a change in leadership right so yeah. to me like a leadership is a very important thing not only when it comes to firearms companies but when it comes to just uh things in life in general usually when we see failures it's because of a failure of leadership and so when smith taking a statement like that i know marty daniel will do that from daniel defense he's done it many times in the past you know he's He's uh, got up there and, and spoken quite a bit uh, about this stuff, so it's good. I think they should all do that. Um, if personally, I mean, if if, if I was uh, going to give advice to the firearm manufacturers out there, I would say that any further gun control enacted at any federal or state level, that they will no longer sell or service or provide anything for law enforcement, just like Barrett did. You know, Ronnie Barrett uh, will not sell or service any Barrett firearms to the state of California because of all their stupid stuff mm -hmm. out there. So yeah. I think more companies should do that. Yeah, I you know I think it is a good thing. If you guys are looking for this, you you can probably find it easy. This came right off of Smith and Wesson's uh, website for anyone who's interested in it. You know, look, there was a time I remember several years ago. I went to Shot Show, and both at Media Day and on the floor of Shot Show, I was talking to some companies, including Smith and Wesson, and you know, like I, I let them give me their spiel, talk about whatever new stuff it was. That was out there and there were some and and in at the end of all those videos i said to whoever i was speaking to right you know what does your company you know have to say about what's happening currently in politics and the, uh, you know in regards to the second amendment 
and there were several companies, not all of them, that told me, hey, we don't talk about politics. We don't, we don't get into that. And I think that that kind of idea is a mistake. When it, if you are in the firearms industry, politics directly affects the, the industry, the business that you're in. Now, there may be some things that have nothing to do with you, but when it comes to the Second Amendment and the assault on that, it 100% has to do with you, right? And we're, we're seeing all of that come back uh, to, to nest right now because the politicians that are out there, including Republicans, are trying to enable people to take down these companies by suing them. You know, there's all kinds of things going on. Well, yeah, it's insane to, you know, it's insane for any firearms company to think that that they can be apolitical when, like, literally so many people in politics want to get rid of them. I mean, like, how can you be apolitical? Uh, if if you own a firearms company, like they, that's like it's like one of the hottest topics in politics that there is. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be that would be like that'd be like a sports broadcaster saying, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to comment on the, I don't want to comment on, uh, you know, basketball. <laughs> like that's your job. Yeah. Like right. you yeah. know, like of course you don't want to like you're calling play by play. So. Everyone, uh, every industry has to think about politics when it's applied to their industry. Like you're saying with the with the sports guys, there's politics involved in that, right? Whether or not we should allow uh, these kids in college to get money, that's a political issue. Right. You can't can't ignore that. Yeah, yeah. But to, I mean, to think about like the only thing that will affect firearms companies is politics or legislation via politics, the politi polit politicization of all this stuff. So. You know, it's insane. I'm glad they finally took a stand on this. I, I think a lot more companies should. And I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, they, these companies got to know where the vast majority of their, of their business comes from. It comes from private citizens. And uh, we're the ones pushing, um, you know, the ball forward. I wish, I, like, I, I don't know why it always takes our money to move the ball in our direction. Like, why is it always our stuff? Like, what mm -hmm. these companies should be should be pitching in as well. And I, and I know a lot of them do. But I think a lot more of them should come out publicly and also uh, yeah. put a little skin in the game, too. Yeah, every single company, it, it, we're all at risk now. You know, I was talking, like I said, there, there's a company that uh, sent out pictures of how a shipper came to them to get uh, blanks. Basically, these are blanks, not lowers, right? I think they were like zero percenters, forgings. And the, the guy, the, the, you know, the guy working, um, working the truck, shipping it, came to them and said, are these gun parts? And they said, no, it's not gun parts. And he said, well, is it going to become gun parts? And they said, yes, eventually it's going to become gun parts. He took them off the truck. <laughs> and he said, yeah, we, we can't ship this. And then they got a letter from the credit card company uh, that they used saying that we are not going to allow transactions that have to do with firearms. That it, th This is like, we're talking about banking. They are not allowed to discriminate. This would be like a bank saying to me, "We're not gonna do let you do business because you're a black guy." They can, you can't say to a company, "We're not gonna let you do business because you're a gun company." This is something protected by the Second Amendment, by the Constitution. And if companies don't uh, don't start talking about this, pushing back, getting together, making plans of what's the alternatives going to be, how do we keep our doors open, how do we fight back when these guys try to shut us down? You know, they, they're going to be destroyed by attrition. So, um, uh, yeah. what, one quick thing I just want to do real quick, because I saw someone gave us something here. Let me just acknowledge this before we get caught up. And just hold that thought for a second here. So, Armin and Axes gave us five bucks. Thanks. I appreciate that, Armin and Axes. He says, as always, showing my support. Great to see Reed here. Again, been sub to him for a long time. Hope to meet him in person soon. There you go. Thanks, Armin and Axes. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, hopefully you will meet Reed soon. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Reed. Go ahead. Your thoughts? No, it's it's, it's fine. Um, you know, the cool thing about oftentimes what you'll see is that there's always a sensationalized story, right? There's always going to be a story where there, I don't know what news sites a lot of people use out there, but there's always going to be a sensationalized news story, and then that's going to rile people up, and then it's like, and then it's the next day it's something else and then it's the next day it's something else and then like a year year and a half two years later there's reconciliation on that 
story. So, like, I'll give you an example. Like, um, mm-hmm. when all the COVID stuff started happening, there was a lot of people in healthcare, like nurses and doctors and everybody else involved with it. And there's a lot of hospitals across the country that were like, you have to get vaccinated or you're going to get fired. And everybody's like, I have a religious exemption. Nope, can't. we're not even recognizing religious exemptions. Mm-hmm. And then everyone talked about how it was the death of religious choice in this country and everything like that. And I yeah. told people... The there were some I firearms said, companies that threatened to do that, and then they backed off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and I told people, I said, look, I don't like it at all. Now, of course I don't like it. If your, your First Amendment is your First Amendment, you can't pass a law or regulation that violates your religion, you know, and um, and they try. And I said, don't worry, this is going to get sorted out eventually. It may take a while, but it will. It doesn't help the people that lost their job right now, but it will get sorted out. And sure enough, in Illinois, of all places, right, there's a hospital that tried to mandate all that stuff and then ended up firing a bunch of people. Well, guess what? They just lost the class action lawsuit, several mm-hmm. million dollars. Mm-hmm. And people, are, people not only get compensation for wages lost but they must be rehired at the same time and level of of seniority that they had before they got fired and that's illinois so Mm -hmm. yeah uh i told you that we had that here in florida man um you know i think well well the florida governor took a little bit of time of doing it but there were hospitals here that were forcing employees to get uh vaccinated yeah. Um, and then they, and then the government came in, and you know the the uh, governor came in and said, "Yeah, you can't do that." But it it already happened to a lot of people that had to get uh, vaccinated, uh, you know, or or face losing their jobs. Yeah. Oh yeah, and it doesn't help people. Like I said, I'm not going to sit here and say it's a good thing, and that you know we should be ambivalent towards it. I'm I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I'm what I'm telling people is that a lot of times, a lot of the outrage stories that we hear today uh, will be generally nothing like in even a few months or a year like you know it's like the retraction in the news stories like when the like new york times or something gets a story wrong which is every day yeah. but uh when they get it wrong like they'll issue a retraction and it's like a one sentence on like the 45th page yeah you know yeah it happened it happened to lola man believe it or not i've spoken about it before um you know they kept hounding her to to get that vaccination and eventually they were like, if you don't get it, we're going to test you like five, six times a day. And, you know, we're going to make you wear something saying that you're not vaccinated. And, you know, I mean, Lola and I, like we've got two kids in school, all kinds of things going on. And I told her, listen, whatever you want to do. At the end, she was like, well, I guess I, you know, I'm going to go and get vaccinated. And she did. And then right after that, the government came out and said, oh, yeah, they can't force you to do it. And I expect I expect to see lawsuits here in Florida as well along the lines oh, of what you're saying. Yeah, it'll, it'll be this way. But but next time that that something like this happens and there will be a next time. This was this was uh, this was, you know, this this was what it was. But the next time that this stuff happens, you know, I'm not shocked that the government at all levels tried to to pull off what they pulled off the last couple of years. I'm not shocked. Like, that doesn't shock me. What what I was shocked at was the level of compliance from people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that stuff, like, the, the next time that this happens, like, it has to be firm. Like, mm-hmm. it has to be absolutely firm. Like, no way. Like, mm-hmm. nope, nope, not, not this time. Um, you know, having to wear certain things on clothing in order to participate in a job or in society or having to show people your papers, that kind of rings a special chord. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's not going to happen in my presence. That's not going to happen. If I see it happening to somebody else, uh, it's going to get dealt with. It's going to get dealt with physically or verbally or maybe both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listen, you know, I'm not trying to knock people either, man. I think everyone, you know, like we went through that. Obviously, I'm in a different position, you know, like um, I work for myself. And it's weird, man. In the last two years, I've worked more than I ever have. Things have gotten like more intense for me, working for myself. And but you know, for a lot of people in healthcare and here in Florida, it's insane. And you know, Lola went through most of this whole thing. She was out there vaccinating people, testing people, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, neither one of us have ever been diagnosed with uh, COVID, by the way. 
So, <laughs> in the yeah, beginning, so- in the beginning of this whole thing, when when they weren't even really acknowledging that it was here, the two of us. Uh, well, I went to uh, Vegas for SEMA show in November before everything kicked off. I think that was 2019. And when I came back, uh, came back in like December. <laughs> I had something that was really bad, really bad, like knocked me on my ass, and it went away, and then it came back again, and then Lola got it, and when we went in to get tested to see what it was, they tested us and said that we both had the B strain of the flu, okay? That was that. Was that. Then after that, the whole entire time, we've never gotten it, including my older son uh, got COVID from his girlfriend. And uh, the rest of us in the house got tested, and we live in the same house. And the rest of us got tested, and none of us got it. <laughs> yeah, go figure, you know? It's weird. <laughs> yeah, it's odd. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so, crazy, man. It's, it's yeah. crazy. And, and, you know, like, like my thing is, is, like, you don't have to, like, do what, like, like, like you know, you, you, you've got to, I mean, that that's what I would always encourage people to do is, like, that's how mm-hmm. stuff happens. Like, when you look at history, that's that's how stuff happens mm-hmm. and um like that stuff can't happen again and you know I'm, I'm prepared to do you know whatever i have to do to, to make sure that, that that kind of stuff doesn't happen thank god i live in a part of the country where that stuff wasn't prevalent where nobody really changed or altered their lifestyle in any way uh thank the lord i live in a part of the country and i live where we do where it was really a non-issue so imagine people getting triple vax quadruple i think lola said that the recommendation is five times vaxxed imagine people doing that what they're doing to themselves and then also consider this like the president uh biden got it and he's at least quadruple vaxxed and so did his wife recently who's also quadruple vaxxed and i don't know how it's good for these old people to be even getting vaxxed that much well, I don't. I don't think it is. I, I'm zero vaxxed, and it's like yeah. I don't even know. I don't even know how that. Like I'm alive. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, some kind of crazy miracle, man. I don't know. No, it's yeah. funny because when I got when I had to, when I was had to get a, when I applied for college, I had to go into the registrar's office. This is a long time ago. This is probably like early 2000s. And I remember going into uh, the college place, and they're like, "Okay, everything's good on your paperwork. All you need is your MMR." And I said, well, what's that? And I didn't know what an MMR was. I had no idea back then. Uh, I'm going to plug in. I didn't know what it was. I said, I don't know what an MMR is. I uh, said, uh, they, and they said, well, it's measles, mumps, and rubella. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, well, I've, ha- I've had them. And the lady goes, no, no, it, it's, it's just one shot. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I've had measles. I've had the mumps. And I've had rubella. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't. I don't need the like I mm-hmm. I've had the diseases like I'm I, like I don't need the shot you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's just crazy how people think about stuff like that yeah um, you know I just I believe what everyone like the the general consensus consensus on this is just an exercise to see what people would accept you know um, and oh, then yeah. and then a mass experiment you know that we're we're all gonna figure out uh, you know they'll they'll come a time when they're when they'll admit to what's going on but. You know, it like you said, man. How much of this? How much more of this do people take? Even the people who you know uh, who participated in this. I'm not knocking anyone, but I think everyone who went through this and and fell into it, the, the next time that they try this, people are going to push back against this. You know, they're gonna say this is bullshit. You guys straight up lied to us and intimidated us and like wrecked the country for no reason. And look at all the years that it's going to take us to recover from it. Well, yeah, I mean that, and and they like that idiot uh, Burks, you know, is, is even in her own book admitted that they knew that nobody would have would at the beginning of this nobody would have just acquiesced yeah. to this yeah. like general. So they lie. lied. So they, they lied. <laughs> they yeah, they lied. Like yeah. they lied. That like from the very beginning they lied. My philosophy on government is this: is that they're generally going to tell you the opposite of what you should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what are you getting attacked by some bats or something out there? There are literally <laughs> bats over there. Yeah, they just yeah. biting each other. <laughs> is that really what's happening? I can hear it. It's That's like oh man, what's happening? Yeah. Wow. What kind of bats do you have out there? I, I don't know. There's a cave like maybe like 50 yards in the direction over there, and then there. Yeah, that's literally. They just had a little scuffle. It's over now. Yeah, 
That's what it sounded like, right? My my uh, my hearing is weird. I think. You know? Oh, we got everything out here, man. We got literally like, everything out here. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, listen, we're gonna start to wrap this up here in a second. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone has any like last minute questions that uh, that you want to ask or comments here or anything like that. But here here's your opportunity to do it. We're past the nine o'clock hour, so we're gonna take one more break. And then after that break, we're going to come back and I'm going to start wrapping this up here with uh, Reed Hendricks of Valor Ridge. I definitely uh, want you guys to make sure you check. We wouldn't be able to keep the Who Moved My Freedom podcast going without the support of manufacturers like Safety Harbor Firearms. SHF is a quintessential family-owned small business totally representative of the American dream. Safety Harbor Firearms is a Florida-based manufacturer of the compact entry stock, and the SHTF 50 upper for an AR-15 lower. Also, SHF happily delivers on your Sten Gun parts needs. So don't forget to check out StenParts.com and SafetyHarborFirearms.com. All right, so um, yeah, so here we are. It's time to start wrapping it up here. Lola just put a link in the chat here for uh, your YouTube channel, Reed Henricks, as well as another link for Valor Ridge. Uh, Reed is an author. He's got two books. You guys can get them from from Amazon, and uh, I, I highly encourage you to do that. You can go on Valor Ridge and sign up for classes, and uh, of course you can you know you can follow him on social media. I'm going to get him to tell you guys all the way that he prefers you all to do it. Um, uh, 42 Chill says great chat tonight. I agree with that. It's always fun hanging out and talking to Reed. Reed, uh, for the folks out there who want to support you, they want to figure out how they can communicate with you, etc. how do they do that, man? Um, well, you can always go to my YouTube channel. It's Reed Hendricks. Uh, that's where I do all my content. And then social media, we do Instagram and Facebook. And that's Reed Hendricks of Valor Ridge. Absolutely. There you go, man. Thanks so much for coming on. It's always good seeing you talking to you i need to come out there if for nothing else just uh, you know i just want to come out and, and like hang out and see that beautiful part of the country that you guys live in man yeah you're always welcome just let me know when you want to come out and we'll be we'll be we'll pick up where we left off absolutely so here's what i'm gonna do right i'm gonna run in the end and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna get words of wisdom for you you know your final words of wisdom to leave with the folks out there so that's what we're going to do here. I just want to uh, remind everyone, I think this is it for this week. We're not going to have any more uh, shows this week until next Monday when we do uh, Free For All Monday. I've got a bunch of uh, stuff here that I'm trying to catch up on. Lots of work going on around here. So uh, Lola's also putting a link for the books on Amazon as well for anyone who's interested in that. Big thanks to everyone who joined us this week and tonight. Uh, this was a great, fun show. So read. Words of wisdom, get them ready. I'm going to run in the end. We're going to come right back here. Let me... All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with us here. We're going to rip the audio out of this, throw it up on iTunes. It's going to be on Audible. Any place that you get your audio podcast from, you can find it, including you could go to hankstrange.com and, and uh, check out all the podcasts. We're also part of the Firearms Radio Network. Once again, big thanks to my friend, Reed Hendricks of Valor Ridge, Reed, you're a good guy, man. I really appreciate you taking time to come on here. And uh, and, and I, I love and miss you, my friend. Well, same here on this end. It's been a long time since we've hung out, but the times that we did, we always had great, great experiences together, long chats into the night. Uh, <laughs> about, you know, mostly about just life and, you know, yeah. not even firearms. We just talked, we got, to, it's just we just got to know each other and uh, those were awesome times and we'll have many more to come. So thanks for even having me on here. I appreciate Absolutely. you asking. Oh, you're welcome, man. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. Grace us with your words of wisdom, my friend. <laughs> figure out where you want to go in life out there. And if you've already been traveled a long road, figure out how you can make it better and pass it on to those that, that come after you. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be difficulties. There's always going to be challenges in that. But um, it's a beautiful life if you don't weaken absolutely thanks reed all right stay right there let me press the buttons thanks to all the folks out there listening uh joining us here i appreciate it let me hit the buttons here <laughs>